trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon. Tonight on 11 Alive News primetime at 8, officers now facing charges after two college students were tased and pulled from their car. Tonight on 11 Alive, different voices united under one message. We hear from people all over Atlanta who tell us why they are rallying in memory of George Floyd. 11 Alive News primetime on the ATL starts now. We're one hour away now from another curfew in Atlanta. Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms ordering everyone off the streets from 9 p.m. until the sun rises tomorrow. Martyr service will continue to operate. But again, this is the fourth night that we have seen uh, this curfew from the city of Atlanta and the fifth night of protests. That's right. Five days, five nights of protests over the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis at the knee of a Minneapolis police officer. Governor Kemp having strong words for people who want to infiltrate peaceful protests and cause violence. During a news conference today, he said rioting and destruction in Georgia is unacceptable. We will do whatever is necessary to keep the peace. If those people that are unruly out there think that we will lay down and we will quit, you are in the wrong state. The governor also praised the work of law enforcement this week, saying that they will continue to be part of a strong police presence in Brunswick on Thursday, when the father and son, the man accused of killing Ahmad Arbery in Glynn County, are scheduled for a court hearing in Brunswick. Let's get you back out now live to those protests happening in downtown Atlanta. Our Hope Ford is at Centennial Olympic Park, where we have seen much of the protests. Um, Hope, are you able to speak with us now? Are you okay out there? Yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good, yeah. All right, go ahead. Tell us what's, what's kind of happening right now. We're a little under an hour from that curfew kicking in, Hope. So you see the crowd out here. There's a huge crowd out here, probably one of the largest crowds that I've seen since the weekend. Um, so we see there's a lot of people out here. There's been a lot of chanting. There's been a lot of singing. There's been a lot of dancing. Uh, things have been really peaceful out here tonight as they have been for the past couple of nights. And we had a huge crew, uh, huge, huge group, excuse me, that joined in with the protesters out here. They came from the Capitol where a couple of them said that tear gas was deployed uh, not too long ago. But uh, there's a lot of people out here right now. And again, they're continuing with the, the you know, to chant and they're continuing to, to have those uh, conversations with uh, the police line that's up there at the on the Marietta Street up there right now. So we've seen a lot of different people out here. A lot of people are saying that this is their first time coming out here, even though it's day five of protests. But we've seen all races and all genders and, and out here tonight and all ages. And um, I talked to uh, one woman uh, earlier today 
and she told me why she felt it was important. She, it was her first time down here, and she told me why she felt it was important to come down here and share the message tonight. I felt the need to come down because I have two black brothers and I have two black nieces, and it pains me at night when I think about the possibilities. And I came down here to show support for my people because I believe in something better than this. This isn't what's supposed to be, and this isn't what's supposed to happen. They shouldn't be pointing guns at their own citizens. We are United States citizens. We are in the United States. This is United States military. They shouldn't be pointing their guns at us. We are their citizens. We are them. That's why I came out here. These possibilities I'm afraid of is my brothers and my nieces getting shot, being unarmed. I'm afraid of them growing up in a place where they can't get fair education, where they can't get fair wages. These are the possibilities. It's deeper. It's deeper than physical. It's deeper than just a gunshot. This is institutionalized. This is something that is grained deep into our system. This isn't something that's on the surface. This right here is just the surface. There's so much more that we should be doing. And I uh, just want to also apologize for some of the prof profanity and uh, that you might have heard a little bit ago. But again, that was you know a lot. That was what a lot of people out here are feeling tonight. And as you can see, a huge, huge crowd out here. It is about an hour until curfew. As we've seen over the past couple of nights, that crowd will start to diminish here in a little bit. Um, but at, right now, everyone is out here. They're protesting, as they have done for the past five days. And of course, we're going to keep you updated with all of everything that's happening right here on the corner of Centennial Olympic Park and Marietta Street. So, Hope, the crowd is bigger than it was 24 hours ago. What about law enforcement and their presence. Does it look any different from what we saw from last night? Are there more uh, Georgia National Guardsmen? Are there more Atlanta police or is it about the same? It's about the same that we've seen over the last couple of nights with that police and uh, Georgia National Guard uh, out here. Uh, again, back around that CNN, uh, the CNN building area out here. So that presence is about the same as we've seen over the last couple of nights. Um, it really, it really compared more to last night, which was probably one of the largest presence that I've witnessed uh, since being out here uh, since Friday. All right, we're about 55 minutes away from curfew as it's 8.05 right now. Hope Ford downtown, thanks. We'll talk to you in a few minutes. Six Atlanta police officers today facing charges seen on videotasing two college students and pulling them from their car Saturday night. The students say they were not participating in the protests at the time. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has more on the charges and the evidence now against those officers. This incident happened near one of the main entrances of Centennial Olympic Park during a demonstration protesting brutal treatment by police. The young man behind the wheel of this car drew attention from police as he tried to record cell phone video of Saturday's demonstration. He slowly drove up. But Officer Ivory Streeter's body cam video shows Streeter chasing the car. Then body cam video shows another officer hitting the car window with a baton. Then police confront the passenger, Tanaya Pilgrim, who doesn't exit immediately because the car is moving. The video shows Officer Mark Gardner responding with his taser. This is a vicious act. The tasing, uh, it went on for some time uh, while she was uh, shaking and screaming. Seconds later, the driver, Messiah Young, gets the same treatment through a broken car window. He's later thrown to the asphalt, breaking his wrist and opening a gash requiring 21 stitches. According to Fulton DA Paul Howard. And no firearm was ever located in the vehicle. Howard says his office is charging four police officers, Lonnie Hood, Willie Sauls, Ivory Streeter and Mark Gardner with felony aggravated assault and other charges. Officers Armand Jones and Roland Cloud face lesser charges in the same incident. I feel a little safer now that these monsters are off of the street and no longer able to terrorize anyone else from this point on. I hope every police officer who thinks it's okay to drag someone, beat someone, do all this stuff because they're cops, um, I hope they're all going to be held accountable as well.
and be safe everyone, please. APD fired officers Streeter and Gardner the next day. The DA says that the six police officers have until Friday to turn themselves in to the city jail. Later in prime time, we are taking a closer look at the body camera video in this case, which caught several different angles of what happened. Today, mothers of children who died amid allegations of brutality gathered on the steps of the state capitol. They spoke about accountability for law enforcement. Jamarian Robinson's mother spoke passionately about her son's death. In 2016, a medical examiner's report said U.S. Marshal shot him 59 times in the back while serving an arrest warrant. The DOJ quickly cleared the officers, but the Fulton County District Attorney is reviewing the case. Shally Tilson's mother also spoke. The 22-year-old from Conyers died from blood clots related to dehydration. He was locked in solitary confinement at the Rockdale County Jail in 2018. His family says he suffered from mental health issues. A grand jury found the staff as a whole failed to recognize and address the decline in his physical and mental state. Theirs were just some of the stories that were shared. Their message, something needs to be done now. We are tired. We are tired of standing in front of cameras and crying and begging for justice. People don't understand the emotions that these families are feeling because you have never been there when you have a son, a grandson, a daughter, a husband, or a father been shot. We are also asking those of you who have been out there protesting to share your thoughts about what you think needs to change. You can call us and leave us a voice message at the number on your screen at 678-765-9514. Make sure you tell us your name and the best way for us to reach you. We hear some of your responses to that question coming up. And this is a live look right now as those protests continue in downtown Atlanta. This is at Marietta Street. Again, this is night five, night four of the curfew at nine o'clock. We're just about 50 minutes out from that. We'll continue to monitor those protests throughout prime time. Well, on this June 2nd, the heat and the humidity is on the rise, and we expect the thunderstorms to be as well. Not tonight, but as we head into tomorrow and towards the weekend, and we're also watching a system in the tropics. We have a new name storm to talk about, and it could impact our weather, so we'll have more on that coming up. And don't forget, as always, we are streaming right now on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe, join the conversation in the community section. There's more 11 Live news in prime time after this break. Break. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every... The family of a man severely beaten at Underground Atlanta now is calling for unity, as family told Caitlin Ross. He was attacked long after vandals smashed windows and then broke into businesses downtown. 
Craig Waters manages properties at Underground Atlanta, and his wife says he went to go check on the damage after everything had died down Friday night. She says he was taking pictures of the damage when seven people approached him. She says he warned them to walk on the sidewalk because there was glass on the ground and he didn't want them to get hurt. She says that's when they turned on him. The woman started pushing my husband, Craig, and um, a man jumped out from behind her and said, uh, don't mess with my sister, and then all seven of them began beating him until he passed out. And I guess at that point, they either got tired of it or thought he was dead. She says he has fractures in his face, and every day more bruises show up. She says right now Craig is in too much pain to talk. She says police are reviewing surveillance footage of the attack, and she hopes there will be an arrest. But she still can't understand why her husband was targeted. Craig doesn't have a racist bone in his body. We have two beautiful black son-in-laws. We have beautiful mixed grandchildren. He didn't deserve this. She says she's hopeful his injuries will be covered by workers' compensation and he'll be able to get back to work after he heals. We are 11 Alive storm trackers watching the temperatures rise and the humidity as well. It is a nice, mild evening out across Atlanta. We are dry for now, but... This time tomorrow, we could be tracking some showers and thunderstorms. Right now, just a few clouds out there this evening, but our high temperatures close to 90 degrees today. We were at 88 in LaGrange, 88 in Rome, 88 in Dalton and Athens, 85 in Atlanta. Uh, but tomorrow, we should be around 88 degrees, and many of these locations will likely be, or be near 90 as we head into tomorrow afternoon. So a mild night tonight. It'll be dry. I think you can start to feel the stickiness in the air. And then tomorrow, we'll see an increase in cloud buildups during the afternoon. Some of those could spawn some showers and some possible thunderstorms. Temperatures expected to get up into the upper 80s by tomorrow afternoon. So the reason why we're warm, of course, while well, we're at June 2nd, but we have high pressure just to our east. That's bringing in a southerly flow. So that warms us up, and it also takes our moisture levels up. We've seen those thunderstorms popping here across parts of the Florida Panhandle and southern Alabama. As we head into tomorrow, we'll see those kind of decay, decay and then reform during the afternoon and evening. And some of those could migrate in here as we head into our dinner hour and the evening hour. So do be prepared for possible downpours, maybe even some lightning with some of these storms. And then becoming a little more widespread as we head into Thursday, the moisture levels continue to rise. We'll still be in, on the warm side and we'll see those daily afternoon storms, 30% chance on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, going up to 40% chance Sunday and into the beginning of next week. So our summertime pattern returns. That means hot and humid with heat of the day storms. We'll have some scattered showers as we head into tomorrow afternoon. And we're going to have to watch the tropics the next few days because we now have our third name, Tropical Storm. And we just started hurricane season yesterday was the official start. But we had two name systems in May, Arthur and Bertha. And now Cristobal forms down here in uh, the southern Gulf, right on the uh, Mexican Gulf Coast. It's going to sit here and spin, meander around these very warm Gulf waters for a couple of days and then start to make its move towards the end of the week. So it's still going to be down here come Thursday. Now Friday it'll start making its way towards the central Gulf Coast very very slowly. So it's going to be around Sunday afternoon when we're tracking this as it approaches the central U.S. Gulf Coast. And it's bringing a lot of rain down here to parts of Mexico. Up to 20 inches there. Mudslides have already happened. As it heads in our direction we expect it to stay a tropical storm strength in, as it heads towards the Gulf Coast. And the spaghetti model is really in unity here showing that it is going to take that northerly track most likely over the weekend making landfall somewhere in between southeast Texas and uh, the Mississippi River Valley. So the next seven days a 20 percent chance of showers on our Wednesday. Most of the day will be dry tomorrow. It'll be mainly afternoon evening isolated showers and storms. Chances go up a little bit Thursday, Friday, Saturday for those heat of the day storms. Nothing severe anticipated yet and then we may see increased rainfall Sunday, Monday, Tuesday as a little bit of that tropical moisture from Tropical Storm Cristobal gets uh, pulled up in here. So hot and humid days 
to come. All right, Sam, thank you. The state's Department of Education is giving us a look at what the next school year might look like as we continue waiting on a vaccine for the coronavirus. The agency released a set of guidelines for kindergarten through 12th grade schools. Our Liza Lucas reports from her home in Fulton County with the details. Think of the 10 pages released by the Department of Education as a blueprint. Districts still have the flexibility to modify and adjust based on their school and community needs. But what this comes down to is a tiered approach based on how the virus is spreading in individual communities. The guidelines break down recommendations into substantial, moderate, or low COVID-19 spread. Here's a closer look at how schools in areas of moderate spread could be affected. In addition to reinforcing basic hand washing and sanitizing, guidelines include shutting off water fountains and providing students with bottled water or allowing them to bring in their own, the elimination of field trips, social distancing on school buses, and in some cases, schools could use alternative cafeteria arrangements like serving meals in classrooms. School systems may opt to screen students and staff by taking temperatures before they enter the building. In areas with a substantial spread of COVID-19, students may be limited to distance or remote learning, and the schools in those areas may remain closed. The guidelines are a lot for families to consider, and we hear you online, some expressing concerns about how such recommendations could be achieved given student numbers and classroom sizes. Others unsure of how such guidelines could affect kids, while some of you say safety comes first. Again, we want to be clear, these are guidelines, not mandates. School systems are asked to coordinate with their local health departments to figure out the best plan going forward. A post from a Paulding County deputy now drawing attention online. It is just a simple paragraph posted on Facebook, but in it, Tyler McSwain tells a story about a trip to Subway where he went to pick up some food in uniform. He says there was a black man in front of him in line. He wanted to smile at him, but thought with everything going on, he wasn't sure that man would want to talk. When they got to the front, he says the man turned back, asked for a recommendation for what cookie he should get. Deputy McSwain said raspberry white chocolate. When the man walked out, Deputy McSwain went to the counter to find a raspberry white chocolate cookie waiting for him. Deputy McSwain said the man has no idea how much that cookie meant to him after the week that he has been immersed in. Coming up next, a veteran haunted by an invisible enemy using his experience to help people struggling with anxiety, how his efforts are helping those cope with COVID-19. And here is a look at downtown Atlanta right now. We are 40 minutes away from the curfew imposed by the city that will run until sunrise. Now the protesters, as you can see, have gathered a man with a bullhorn in front of them, shouting instructions, and not far away is law enforcement. We will continue to update you the very latest on this developing story here on the, on the ATL. We hear you and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 
we are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority. Another live look at downtown Atlanta right now. It, this is Marietta Street, where we uh, frequently see the largest groups of protesters gathering. It is now 8.23. We are uh, just a little over half an hour away from that curfew. Uh, this is the fourth night of that curfew put in place by Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. And the fifth night of protests we began on Friday, and it has continued every night since then. Uh, at this point, a very very large crowd compared to uh, what we have seen at various points throughout the, fa the past few days here. This crowd in the entire intersection uh, down there. Uh, it's usually around this time or shortly uh, after when we start to see some action from law enforcement as we do get closer and closer to that 9 p.m. curfew. So we are, of course, are watching live and will continue to do so throughout the evening to keep you uh, in the know about what's happening in downtown Atlanta and the conditions of these protests. Well, this is how it has been playing out over the last few nights, and, and that is we see an increased activity. The most activity it builds to this sort of crescendo as we get to uh, around 8.30 and make our way toward 9 o'clock. Once 9 o'clock gets here, we do not hear uh, warnings from law enforcement. Past, uh, you know, past protests, we have heard those kinds of warnings, but when 9 o'clock gets there, uh, the police and the Georgia National Guard begin to march forward, and with that, they arrest those that do not dissipate. We are taking a look at you can see the Waffle House there on Centennial Olympic Park Drive. Lucky Street is right behind it. And there is the armored personnel uh, carrier right there at the crosswalk. You can see more people walking on the sidewalks right now. And traffic is not being allowed uh, in there other than official traffic right now. That's Lucky Street uh, that we are looking and peering down at in front of the Ferris wheel. So uh, most of the crowd has now gathered. They have assembled at the apex between Centennial Olympic Park and the McCormick and Schmick and the bridge area that connects CNN uh, with the uh, parking lot for or the, the, the parking building, uh, parking deck that has been there for many years for employees and then the workspace, the, uh, the CNN center across the street. Again, a lot of law enforcement vehicles uh, gathered there behind that uh, skirmish line that we know. And this is again our, our sky tracker view. And we're moving now closer to the state capitol where we do know over the last few days there has been a large law enforcement presence as well. Yesterday, we saw many of those protesters marching back and forth between that location we were just at near Centennial Olympic Park and then moving towards the uh, state capitol. We'll, of course, continue to follow these protests and what we're seeing there on the ground ahead. We'll be right back. Bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just Seconds away from being 30 minutes until the curfew begins here in the city of Atlanta that put in place by Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms for the fourth night as we are now in the fifth night of protests. We're looking right now outside the college uh, football hall of fame there in downtown Atlanta uh, that museum that uh, that tourist attraction had its windows broke out on the or broken out rather on the first night of protests that we saw we're looking now with our sky tracker seeing various uh, equipment and apparatus and vehicles from um, the Georgia National Guard uh, and now we're seeing that large protest group that is at that main location where we see them night after night outside of Centennial Olympic Park at the top of your screen, we see Atlanta police bicycle officers there in those bright green, those bright yellow uh, uniforms, maintaining that skirmish line where we often see protesters going up, having conversations with them, speaking with them. And uh, usually behind that, we'll then see those Georgia National Guard troops and other vehicles as well, Jeff. And we are looking right now, as you said, at um, Marietta Drive right there, and we kind of Taking a look at the crowd, it looks like a similar crowd to last night, similar in, in dimension and scope, maybe a little bit larger, but uh, certainly not, not significantly different from what we saw 24 hours ago. Question is, in 29 minutes, will we see the same response from law enforcement that we have been seeing since the curfew was enacted a few days ago by Mayor Bottoms and Chief Shields? Uh, as they move very, very quickly, most of the area of Centennial Olympic Park has been cleared by the time we get to about 20 minutes after the hour. So they move very rapidly. Those who elect not to move along the sidewalk or along the street uh, are, are subsequently arrested. We saw four or five of those on camera last night, but we'll see if it has a different sort of lilt tonight as far as protesters versus law enforcement on Centennial Olympic Park Drive, which has become a nightly occurrence now. We heard from Governor Brian Kemp today updating us on coronavirus, but also uh, speaking a lot about the protests that we have been seeing for the last few nights. He says that he knows it's an emotional time, a powerful moment, but he did say that at least for that first night and when we have seen those moments of, of violence that it's being corrupted. Uh, he says that he does support protests and um, those who have the right to do that. But again, he is calling for people 
not to engage in activity or in actions that promote violence throughout these protests. He did say also that he was proud of the work that's being done by the various law enforcement organizations that are out there. In addition to Atlanta police, in addition to the Georgia National Guard, we know that there have been state troopers out there and also uh, law enforcement agents from various surrounding jurisdictions that have come into the city of Atlanta um, throughout various points of these protests that we have seen. Let's go live now to the ground where our Hope Ford is live and hope you've been there many, many days uh, as we have been watching these protests. Uh, do you see any differences today between some of the other nights that you've been out there? Um, I will say probably one of the largest difference is this has probably been the largest crowd uh, that I've seen probably since the weekend. There were several groups that came together here at Centennial Olympic Park at the corner of Centennial Olympic Park in Marietta, where all of those protests have taken place. Um, there's still a large crowd out here right now, but it's starting to dwindle down. It's starting to dwindle down because there are a lot of people in the crowd who are reminding people, okay, it's 9 o'clock coming, it's 8.30 now, you guys need to go home. So a lot of people have started to uh, turn around, and you can see them right now. They're turning around and making their way um, from this area right now. But the, the, you know, the, the vibe out here tonight has been as it has been since really Saturday. It's been very peaceful. There's been a lot of people, a lot of first timers, a lot of first timers who are coming out here who are saying, you know, I'm seeing it on social media. I'm seeing it on TV and want to come out here and see for myself what's going on. And I want to come out here and I want to experience it for myself. So there's been a lot of people who have come out here tonight who wanted to experience that for the first time and have talked to us about, you know, really why they were wanting to come out here because they want to show unity and they feel like they're not being heard. So they want to continue. They really want to continue to get that message across. So. That crowd you see right there is, I mean, it's its probably maybe a fourth of the crowd that was out here uh, just a few minutes ago. But again, it is starting to dwindle down as I continue to hear people in the crowd going, hey, it's 830, you know, um, it's time to go home. You know, we'll see you back here tomorrow. So, you know, they, that's what's been happening probably in the last couple of minutes now. Um, over the last few days, or particularly yesterday, we did see some uh, groups frequently marching back and forth between the central location of the protest and to the state capitol and various other um, locations. Have we seen and noticed any large groups taking off for those marches and returning, uh, at least compared to what we saw yesterday? Yeah, we did see that a couple of times today. There were a couple of uh, groups who you know, would take off marching uh, either to the Capitol or to different sections uh, of the city or really just to walk around the park and come back right back here. We've seen that a couple of times today. Um, there was one point where two groups kind of went in different directions and marched, and then they all came together at one point in time. Uh, there was actually one group that marched from the Capitol. Uh, several, several of them said that they had just deployed tear gas there, so they marched back to this, second, this uh, intersection uh, right here. And I do just want to say probably about 10 minutes ago before people really started breaking up, the entire crowd, the entire crowd dropped to a knee and went silent for just for about a minute. The whole crowd joined in on that and that seemed to be kind of the way that they wanted to end things officially here tonight. So when that happened, got up and you started to hear a lot of those announcements for people to to break off and go home. And they said, you know, we'll see you back here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All right, Hope, thank you so much. I know uh, we just noticed somebody who was a, a legal observer from the ACLU walk past with a, a, a vest on out there. So we have some of those folks out there. Uh, we also understand our Joe Hinky sending a tweet out not too long ago that there was a heart uh, drawn in the sky over Centennial Olympic Park as this uh, is the fifth night of those protesters um, out there. You know, when you look at so many young faces, a lot of very diverse faces that you're seeing tonight. And I guess I'm showing the fact that I'm, I've been raising children a long time and I have a, a, an older teen in my house right now. Uh, so many kids looking for summer jobs that just aren't there this year. You know, this is going to be a very difficult summer for a lot of young people as there are not opportunities for employment. You know, there are 30 million people estimated to be out of work uh, as a result of COVID-19. And, and it, 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 it certainly makes for uh, uh, what would make uh, for a very difficult summer ahead with, with so many kids, you know, that want to be working, that can't be working. And uh, quite frankly, you know, you want to be part of a group. You want to do something. You want to feel like you're doing something good for the betterment of everyone.
Yeah, and you know, we've heard a lot and seen a lot about some of the, the moments of violence. A lot of protesters saying show the, the good moments, show the peaceful moments um, that we have seen over the past few days. And when we were hearing from Governor Brian Kemp earlier, he did say also that some of these groups and some of the protesters themselves have been very helpful in letting them know information, letting law enforcement know information about people in the crowd who had uh, intentions that might not be the best um, that he said was happening here in Atlanta and in other cities in the state. He said also that he would be willing to have an open dialogue with people who wanted to speak with him. He said that that is part of government as long as that would be a productive conversation. Um, something else of note that we did hear and learn from um, Governor Kemp's remarks mm. about these protests. There's been a lot of discussion all over the country about who might be participating and if there are people coming in from outside of the state and what what groups might be participating in this. And so we did hear um, during the governor's briefing from the GBI director, Vic Reynolds, and he said that they do have some intelligence on bad actors as protesters that are on the ground that belong to organizations, uh, various groups who uh, their aim, their intent is to cause destruction. Uh, he said that they are evaluating arrests that have been made thus far and to see where the people are from and that hopefully they'll be able um, to have all of that information gathered in the near future. But I did think it was interesting what we just heard from Hope there saying that people are encouraging others to leave and come back another day. Um, that is a different scene from what we have seen uh, early on in these protests when people would remain for for much more, uh, longer after the protest and um, after the official protest had ended or much longer af uh, after the curfew that has been enacted night after night by the mayor. This is the view f again from Sky Tracker that we are looking at right now and we are approximately 20 minutes away from the curfew imposed by the city and that's when law enforcement begins to march them down the road and to try to shepherd them uh, to transportation away from the downtown area. There's also been some concern during these protests about the coronavirus pandemic. That's something else that was discussed earlier today. We've heard from our medical experts as well and others just about the concern because we know that transmission does come in close quarters with people singing, people chanting, things of that nature. We do understand that the um, State Department of Public Health is working with Fulton County to try and um, make some pop-up locations for people who are out there protesting as well as the law enforcement uh, presence that's out there to get tested. And again, there is that concern. And so they're encouraging anyone who is out there who has been out in any protest, regardless of where it is in the state, to go ahead and get tested. We're hearing the public safety alert that is coming across all of the electronic devices among those at the park and certainly those of us in the studio and you at home as well. A reminder that nine o'clock is coming very quickly. We are 20 minutes away. I also wanted to mention the Atlanta police officer who was injured when the ATV, the 42-year-old suspect who uh, was intentionally trying to hit Atlanta police, uh, a guy that was found to be intoxicated. Uh, but the injury is to Maximilian Brewer. I just watched a piece on him from the Atlanta Police Department of his love of motorcycles from the time that he was a kid. He was riding, and he, and he, you know, talked about his love of riding and serving the people. And I, I, I want to mention the GoFundMe account that has been set up in his benefit. Uh, as the mayor said today, he has a very, very long recovery ahead of himself with some very serious injuries to his legs. He is not a young man, and uh, a recovery uh, certainly is going to be a very, very arduous journey for him. And. Uh, you know, he could use some help. And again, a GoFundMe account set up for Maximilian Brewer. It's spelled B-R-E-W-E-R. -E -E and uh, he would be most appreciative of any help that any of us can give. And he has been giving to us for a very long time in this city with his service of 18 years, uh, we should give back to him as well. And certainly we can link you to that information on 11alive.com. And on our 11 Alive app, we have stories about Officer Brewer, so you can find out more information there if you'd like. Uh, I want to go ahead and bring in Ron Jones right now. Ron, I know you've been watching these protests with us here night after night. Uh, what are you anticipating as we are now less than 20 minutes uh, ahead of that curfew from the city?
Well, you know, we're just, like you said, less than 20 minutes away. My concern is the folks who are not leaving. And we're watching people just slowly kind of trickle away. And Hope Ford kind of talked about that during her live broadcast. But just those who are still staying as we get closer to the curfew deadline. And you still see those officers in the yellow jacket, the fluorescent jackets. Those are part of the bicycle team. And, or the Atlanta cops who are, are, you know, they ride the bicycles. But behind them, as you can see, you have those who are part of the protest crew. And they have the, the full... They, they have the helmets, the shields, they have the body armor, they're ready to move in, and more than likely they're going to take the place uh, of those who uh, ride the bicycles. And then directly behind that, you also have, um, you also have the Georgia National Guard who's going to move in as well. So my concern is that more people are going to get arrested. We haven't had any major injuries. However, the potential is still there. And so I am hoping that the officers who are communicating with some of the folks there, you can see them kind of milling around, some of them thinking about leaving. I'm hoping that they will listen to the officers. The officers have connected to them in such a way that they're leaving. And guys, look at that. Look at the people who are leaving now, hopefully heading to their cars and getting out of there. Hey, Ron. So um, maybe those conversations between the bicyclists and, and the protesters are working. Ron, I'm, I'm looking at Twitter here. Ben Brosh works for the AJC. He's one of the reporters on the scene, and he has just tweeted nine minutes ago some video at five points showing people are looting uh, some of the businesses. I'm looking at the video right now. Again, his name is Ben Brash, a reporter with the wow. AJC, and according to the tweet here, the people are trying to get the looters to stop, but that is going on right now at five points, which uh, is not very far away from Centennial Olympic Park. And here's the problem with that, Jeff, when you think about that in other parts of the country, and I think we've seen it in Minnesota, and um, I'm not quite sure, maybe Philadelphia, I'm not quite sure, but some of those store owners are now showing up with guns. They're showing up with firearms, and they're trying to protect their investment. So that could turn into a tragic situation when you have a confrontation between the looters, as you know, and also those who are agitators, those who are criminals. Basically, if you're breaking into someone's you know, business, has nothing to do with George Floyd. It's all about you instilling someone else's property. That can turn into a deadly situation. And then think about APD. APD is going to have to run around the city and try to stop that as the information comes in, making their job even more difficult, despite the fact that the governor has brought in, what, 3,000 troops, started with 500, then you know, increased it to 1,500, now 3,000 troops. And he also said during the news conference that because of the attacks in Atlanta, because of the discord in Atlanta, that most of the troops are right here in Atlanta, not in Brunswick, not in other parts of Georgia, but most of them are committed to Atlanta. But we hope that the looting stops because it can turn deadly, as you know. Ron, is it a good idea in your experience in law enforcement for shop owners of small businesses you know, this is their flesh and blood, so to speak. Their entire lives are wrapped up in many of these businesses. If, if they become armed, is, is that a deterrent, or are they more at risk for getting injured as a result of possessing deadly force? Man, I, I, you know, they tell you all the time, just be a good witness. I know it's their lifeblood. I know they probably have passed those businesses on from generation to generation but it's better to leave it up to the professionals. Don't go down there with a firearm, because think about this. Let's say that I show up with a firearm and I'm trying to protect, protect Ron Jones barbecue, and I got my shotgun out there, and I'm keeping all these protesters away, or all these criminals away who's trying to you know, take away my lifeblood, and then the police show up. The police show up, all they're gonna see is Ron Jones has a shotgun. Is he a protester? Is he a business owner? What's going on? The best thing to do, I believe, is to immediately leave it up to the professionals and let them handle it. And I know it's going to be late before they get out there, but, you know, I, I hate to say this, and I, I'm not in their shoes, but, you know, you have business insurance as well. Yeah. And notice, guys, that now you have um, more of the elite officers who are moving up to the front as we get closer to the curfew. Hey, Ron, could you give out the address of your barbecue restaurant that you have? <laughs> uh, you know, that was just, just an analogy. I, oh, I see. But okay. if, you know, you know, who knows what can happen in the future. Uh, 
<laughs> Offer me a job, would you? I'll come to work for you. You would be an excellent boss. <laughs> okay. It is now 847 right. on this Tuesday night. We are a little over 10 minutes away from the city of Atlanta's curfew coming into place and we are seeing the actions that we have been seeing the last few days starting to uh, take place as we do get closer and closer to that 9 p.m. curfew. Let's switch gears a little bit now and hear from some folks that we have been speaking with on the ground about why they are protesting what matters to them. I understand from a safety point where the curfew comes in at, but personally as a protester, I will do my job, come out here as early as I need to do, and then when the looting and whatever happens, I, I slide. I slide because personally, I don't want to get hurt. That's and I don't know who my enemy is out here in these streets at this point, but the 9 p.m. curfew. Okay, we're going to go back out live now because we do see some folks running out there. Uh, live out at Centennial Park just near there. Uh, we did see some folks running there. Again, this is what we have begun to see night after night as it gets closer to the curfew. We see on there uh, to, towards the bottom and then to the right of your screen, we see some of those bicycle officers leaving that area. And Ron noted a little while ago that we saw some others advancing, coming closer to that side of Marietta Street. What we typically have seen, uh, more running there on the top right of your screen. Uh, usually we do see some action starting to happen around this time from law enforcement to go ahead and get folks moving away. And yesterday it did appear to be uh, successful. In the background there, you're seeing some folks throw some things back in the direction of officers. And again, this is what we tend to see around this hour of the evening as that curfew gets closer and closer. Law enforcement out there start to take action to disperse the crowd. We see some folks take off running away from that skirmish line and then we see them start to head back for a little bit. We're going to go now live to Hope Ford. Uh, Hope, what are you seeing? Does it, be does it begin to look like we're starting to see some tear gas and things being uh, tossed out from law enforcement out there at this point? Uh, from where I am, I haven't seen any tear gas. So I'm not smelling any tear gas, so I, I can't really speak to that right now. It's only, it's only, uh, it's about what 8:49 right now, and that large crowd that you saw um, running away. Not really sure what prompted that, um, but right now there, uh, we haven't seen any tear gas being fired. But that crowd is moving back. This is around the time where protesters you know, are saying we have until nine o'clock. Why are you, you know, why are you pushing us back? Why are you throwing uh, tear gas at us? We have until nine o'clock to protest. Um, so that's a little bit of what you're seeing right now. There's a large portion of the of the crowd that, you know, has already left that has moved back. So what you're seeing right now, there's fireworks going off into the background and then it looks like We're just kind of taking in the scene right here to see um, what's no, happening. Is that fireworks? That looks and like fireworks. I tell you, a lot of the protesters. Yeah, that's just fireworks. Yeah. That's just fireworks going off right now. Um, that kind of scares the crowd a little bit, and they start to to move out. Um, so again, what we're seeing right now is that crowd kind of kind of moving back. And Hope, I will say it does appear from the aerial shots that we have been able to see um, from back here in the studio that the crowd does seem to have significantly diminished just from the top of the eight o'clock hour. Um, so it does seem that some folks have heeded the advice of other protesters that have been encouraging folks to go ahead and head home and to get out there um, to get out of that that area. We do know that Marta uh, services will continue tonight for the past few nights with the curfew. Those services were suspended, but we understand um, that those services will continue um, tonight. Hope, talk to us a little bit more about what you've been hearing from some of the people out there on the ground today. Well, you see there, the, I mean, there is one minute out here right now who's upset that that we're out here. And for anyone who is watching this, I just want to let you know that we have been out here since four o'clock this afternoon. And we've been out here since four o'clock uh, in the afternoon every day. Hey, Hope, Friday, should, should we take it here? We'll, we'll let you get away from, why, why don't we take it right now? We'll let you get away from that guy. And uh, that'll give you a little bit of a buffer there, a little room to get away from him and he can chill. And we'll come back to you in a couple of minutes. Uh, again, we're about eight minutes 
away from nine o'clock right now, and I've been looking at the AJC website here, the, the Twitter feed, rather, uh, of Ben Brash, who is a reporter, and he is at five points. The, the looting uh, video that he is showing on his, uh, on his Twitter feed right now is at the five points uh, uh, shoe store, their sports shoe store, it's the Foot Locker. So that's where that's coming from, if you wanna check that out. So we are looking at the heavy police presence right now and uh, waiting just as we have every night at this time, waiting for nine o'clock. And when nine o'clock comes, these officers begin to move, the ones that are in front, and then the Georgia National Guard behind them will serve as a sort of backup and strength behind them. And we are starting to see them assemble right now. This is, you know, 53 on the hour, Jennifer, and yeah. almost like clockwork. And if you look at the top right hand uh, side of your screen, that's where we are seeing some of those troops coming closer and closer. Um, right now where they are again on Marietta Street, Typically, we start to begin to see that law enforcement presence come forward towards the bottom of your screen and take over that intersection. Earlier in the day, we'll see protesters in the middle of that intersection, right up there again, face to face with law enforcement, having those conversations, uh, getting their feelings out, giving them um, their, their opinions or thoughts. But again, around this hour is when we start to see that protest um, kind of be pushed back, the, that group be pushed back by law enforcement. Again, they typically move from the top of your screen and kind of expand out to kind of keep that open square of the intersection open and clear. And so uh, I anticipate that might be what we begin to see uh, in the next few minutes as they uh, effort to disperse the crowd out there. Um, let's bring Ron Jones back in. Ron, when we look at this every night and we see that expansion of the of the law enforcement crowd of the, the, the Georgia National Guardsmen and the Atlanta police, uh, what might be the the strategy behind kind of clearing out that intersection and then kind of blocking themselves out? You know, um, the governor said it this afternoon during his press conference. He says, I don't care how long they're going to be out here. I'm kind of paraphrasing here. He says, but they are not those who are enacting violence. They are not going to wear us out. They are not going to discourage us. If you are breaking the law, we will be there. And obviously, that's exactly what they're doing. I mean, just the amount of National Guardsmen that are, are there, just the rows and rows, the squads and squads, several platoons are there to take on any violent protests right now. And we saw the strategy of the, of the bicyclists, the, the police bicyclists, get out of the way. They're like up there, you know, for the first two or three hours, and they're trying to engage with the protesters, try to start that conversation. And before you know it, they're out, and the National Guardsmen are in. But just look at the amount of officers and National Guardsmen that are there to try to send a message to agitators because they want them to protest during the day, right? They want them to be able to express themselves and their outrage of what's happened across our country. But they're saying, if you break the law, which you have five minutes to get out of here because that's when the curfew starts, we are going to take action. And the best way to confront any type of threat and not just protest, whatever it may be, is with overwhelming force overwhelming and, troops and that's exactly what they have here and kind of to your point Ron you know the question was also made during that briefing with the governor and others um, that they won't be tired that they are giving them adequate food they're giving them adequate uh, time to rest and to switch folks in and out and they're speaking with them about their mental health and um, their physical health and stamina and all of these things as they are sending them out there um, they say that this is what they're trained to do and so that these National Guard members from Georgia are going to be ready to participate not only here, but in other parts of the state and also with the coronavirus response that they have been a part of um, for the last few months here in Georgia as well. And when you think about it, especially if they're putting on those protective masks, those gas masks, they are ready to fire the tear gas. It's going to happen. I mean, there's just no way around it. And then you look at the, the front part of, of that force there. I would say there's like, what, 10, 12 rows? They call them squads right there on that skirmish line. And then behind them, and then behind that huge army of troops, there's even more National Guardsmen or, and men and women who are ready to push forward. So I would, if I was one of the protesters, I had four minutes left. The best thing to do is to head to my car and just get out of Dodge. But if they're going to stay there, and we've already seen some of them begin to throw bottles or throw objects that way, they are trying to 
create this conflict by staying and also engaging with the National Guard's men and women. All right, Ron, All right, let's Ron. get on now to Chinu Her. He has been out there today among the protesters as well. Chinu, what can you tell us about what's going on where you are? Yeah, guys, right now we're just a few minutes from that curfew, and right here, on the left, you have all the protesters on this side, and then over here, you have all the law enforcement lined up, and they have moved up forward a little bit uh, after people started throwing water bottles that way. Again, we're just a few minutes from that curfew, and there are still uh, quite a few people here still uh, protesting right now. So uh, we're still uh, we're at the front of the crowd right now. Police are right here. We're a couple minutes from that curfew. We're still waiting to see if this crowd does disperse or what's going to happen next. But we'll be right here, right here at the front of the crowd. Uh, so far, it has uh, uh, gone down a little bit after um, after uh, uh, people started throwing stuff earlier. Uh, I have a gas mask here just in case uh, they do disperse some, uh, um, uh, some gas. But again, we're right here up the front and we'll bring you an update as soon as anything happens, guys. You heard, thank you. We'll check in with you in a couple of minutes. And it is uh, coming up on about 8.59. We're about one minute away from the curfew kicking in. And with that, we will, in all probability, see law enforcement began to advance the way that we have all night. All right. Curfew now is approaching one minute at 8.59. And we're seeing protesters right now. Again, we're taking a look at Marietta Street. This is at Centennial Olympic Park Drive. And there is a, a bit of a buffer here between protesters and law enforcement, as you can see. There has been a couple of guys out with bullhorns instructing the crowd, giving them some observations. o'clock hour time now 8:59. we are waiting for the nine o'clock curfew to officially go into effect we have been with you throughout the evening as we watch this increase law enforcement presence jeff with a crowd that always seems to increase as we go further into the evening yeah this has been a, a large crowd tonight you know at first i think about an hour ago it looked like it was about the same size and, and now it looks just a little bit bigger than what we saw last night. It now is officially 9 o'clock. Curfew in the city of Atlanta is underway until sunrise. We have multiple crews on the ground. We're giving you this look from above as well as we uh, get ready to see. How long will it take them tonight to move in? Last night they started to move in about 9.02 started to move in about 902 Ron and as we see it's nine straight up and the line is moving in Ron tonight they waited 35 seconds into nine o'clock yeah it's happening right now and you can see the bottles are heading towards the officers as well the tear gas is going to be shot any moment now our very own Chinu her is live on the scene he says he's waiting to see if they're going to fire the tear gas it's not a if it's like when it's going to happen they're wearing it and uh, Chinu, um, I believe or if Chinu is ready to talk to us, let us know. Let us know what's going on from your perspective. Hey, Ron. So I do have a gas mask on right now. Uh, it looks like they Hi. have already uh, uh, shot off some gas here, and they're pushing people out of here. Law enforcement and military are pushing people out of the way now, and people are starting to clear out. They have the streets all blocked off. We're going to start to back up a little bit here. Uh, but right now, gas has been shut out. The tear gas is out on the streets now, and they have it blocked off. They've pushed people out of this area, and as they were doing so, people were throwing bottles out into the crowd where the law enforcement and the military were. So again, guys, this is what's going on right now. Tear gas has been shot. Crowds are being pushed back, and you can see they're starting to march forward down Centennial Olympic Park here. Uh, we are staying out of the way, but we'll show you where they're heading right now. So they're heading right down the street here, marching down Centennial Olympic Park, pushing the clouds that way. So right now, no civilians out on the street here. Military and police pushing everyone down the street here.
You know, uh, Aisha, I was going to point out, I know Chinu's down there trying to do what he's doing. Aisha, I was going to point out, even before we got to this point, it was like Let's go to Hope Ford right now. Hope Ford on the ground right now. Let's go to that were there. We're going to pop in and go to Hope Ford right now, Ron. Okay. okay shh. Go, go, go. All right, so our crews are getting out of the way right now as we see the tear gas and the smoke bombs going off. People jumping fences and trying to get out of the way of the tear gas. Crews moving in within the first three minutes of this, really about just 30 seconds into the nine o'clock hour. Plumes of smoke and tear gas filling yeah, I, the air downtown, Ron, as they try to get these crowds out of there. Absolutely, and you know, if I were our crew members right now, especially with Hope, I'd probably get out of there because she's not wearing a gas mask. And I tell you what, Aisha, I have uh, tasted that gas many times before in the military, and and uh, also um, within the police department. And there's nothing you can do. It burns your eyes. It burns your throat. There's no way that you can get your wits about you. You just got to get out of the area. It also burns your skin as well. I'm, I'm hearing from the producer at the same time, Aisha. Is he saying that Hope is live with us now? Yes, getting word from our producers that Hope and her photographer are okay. They are talking to us and communicating. Although that scene looked pretty dramatic, we are thankful to report that they are okay, even though Hope wasn't wearing a mask, she did get out of there in time enough, Ron. Let's go back to Hope Ford on the ground and right think now. about this, uh, we're gonna go back to. Yeah, guys, can you hear me? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes, Hope, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I know that looked really dramatic. Um, there were a couple tear gas cans that landed right at our feet. There were also people who were trying to uh, tear down some things right there, so that's why you saw that. Um, I, tonight, I, I've been covering this for a few days. Tonight, I saw something I haven't seen before. You're looking at a, uh, this row of Georgia National Guardsmen. Um, this is not the same row that we've seen at the other end of Marietta Street and Centennial Park. This is an entirely different row uh, for the first time. I've seen them kind of flank both sides of the street. So when protesters were trying to run away from the tear gas, at, on the, and you have to excuse both of us right now, we got hit with a lot of tear gas, but when those protesters were trying to run away from Centennial Park and Marietta Street, they ran into this line of National Guardsmen who tried to corral them into one area so that they could all run in one direction so that everyone wasn't splitting up into several different directions. That's why we, as we try to run down the street, as again, we've been out here every night for the, since Friday. Whenever we try to come down the street, we got stuck in between them. There was a lot of tear gas that was coming. A couple of National Guardsmen did pull us out, put us to the side, told us to put our heads down as all that gas and f fireworks were going off. So that's, what, that's why what you saw kind of looked a little dramatic. We're okay. We did not get a direct hit because we were able to get out of the way. Um, we are seeing a, a couple of arrests uh, right now for those, a couple of people who were trying to t tear down some things a little bit earlier. And there's still a lot of tear gas in the air. There's even a, a couple of, uh, a lot of people, even a couple of National Guardsmen who didn't quite have their mask on tight enough, they're actually coughing and spitting up right now. And we're gonna walk a little bit further away because it's getting too thick. And as you said, I don't have a mask on. So we're gonna, Hope, I was going to ask you, it, this was Ron Jones, I was going to ask you, is it actually working? I mean, just from your vantage point, are the protesters leaving that area? Are they leaving that area? Is it, is it, being, is it effective, what they're doing right now? The, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. The, uh, the protesters are, for the most part, gone. And I just want to say that they're the overwhelming majority of the protesters were already gone. There were, you know, there was a little bit left. I'm sorry, guys, I can't talk right now. 
All right, we're going to pop back out from Hope Ford there. Hope Ford inundated with tear gas. We're going to give her and her crew a minute to reset. That is our primary focus tonight, not only bringing you balance and accurate information, but making sure our crews on the ground are safe. As we have been reporting this story, this is the time where we have seen this uh, tear gas scene on live TV uh, at its most dramatic point, Ron. It seems like uh, as soon as I sat down at nine o'clock, it was about 30 seconds into the nine o'clock hour where they pounce. It seems like the um, the patience is wearing thin. A lot of people are saying, well, how many more days are they going to be out there? How long is this going to go on? There is no answer to that, but it does appear that the goal is indeed to wrap this thing up as quickly as possible once night falls and once curfew goes into effect, Ron. And you know what's interesting? We're going to toss it to you, and I just want to say this real quick, Aisha, and that is the governor said today that the agitators, not those who are protesting, the agitators are not going to wear them out. They're going to bring more troops there, as we just saw, to try to take on any type of violence. Let's get to Chinu Her. He's live on the scene as well. Chinu, what can you tell us? What can you show us? Yeah, Ron, so I'm standing actually uh, closer to where all of this started and when all the uh, the tear gas uh, went off, I had a mask on earlier, but right now it seems like it's starting to kind of go away. You can still smell it a little bit, but right now you just have lots of military right here all posted up everywhere. Um, just making sure, just holding it down. Um, there are some protesters a little bit further down the street, probably where Hope is. Um, I'm a little bit uh, further up the street, but right where I'm standing, you only see all the military uh, personnel, all the police uh, holding this down. Um, they've been standing here for a little bit, just, just manning this. Um, it seems like for the most part, all the protesters, all the civilians uh, are out of this area, maybe down the street a little bit more. Um, it just uh, a couple of minutes ago, I took the mask off and it has been uh, a lot better. So uh, I'm able to not wear the mask right now. But earlier, uh, there, there was uh, quite a bit of gas in the air and people started running as soon as that happened. And that happened right as police announced the curfew and then protesters started throwing water bottles and other things into the crowd of military and police. That's that's when they started marching forward and shot the tear gas. Uh, that was just a few minutes ago. But again, right now here uh, at this end of the street, it's just military and police uh, holding down this part uh, and making sure that everyone is out of this area. All right, Chinu, thank you so much. We are glad that you are safe. Uh, let's run back some video that we just turned around of the moments that that tear gas was shot out. Uh, near the scene where Hope Ford was. Guys, it's only 10 after 9, and crews out there, they are not messing around uh, with how soon they're going to get people out of there. This is video from about seven minutes ago of that tear gas being fired off, people trying to run and scurrying out of the way, jumping fences and running in all different directions, trying to get away from that tear gas. Now, Ron, tell us about uh, this technique and you were asking um, how beneficial it was and, you know, just how soon it's going to help people to get out of there because you can't sustain tear gas too many times. Hope Ford couldn't even talk. No, it, it is. No, I'm telling you, it, it is an overwhelming force. So just show you how crazy it is. When I was in the military, they still do it. They put you in a room, they lock the door, and they bust tear gas in there so you can get the full effect. And what we noticed there with what Hope was dealing with, and also Tyson Paul, one of our photojournalists as well, is that once it hits your skin, once it hits you in the face, man, there is nothing that you can do if you're not wearing a mask. It is overwhelming, involuntary. You cannot hold your composure. That's why Hope says, hey, guys, I can't talk to you right now because I have a little bit more tear gas uh, in my system or in my eyes and my nose and my throat. But look at this. You see how all the National Guardsmen are all across the street, right? In the past, it seems like some of the protesters, agitators, were, were able to run around them. Well, as those National Guardsmen are able to move down the street, they're kind of scraping the sides, making sure that nobody can actually get through, and then that's when they're able to make the arrest. And once again, Aisha, as you know, this is a live look at uh, what's taking place downtown.
Yeah, we are back with you live right now, and it seems like the crowd of protesters has uh, really started to scatter about as a result of those techniques to get people to abide by the curfew as close to nine o'clock as possible. And Ron, tonight was my first time leaving the station on uh, the moment that I had to uh, step away here. And this is being felt, it's far beyond downtown. You try to get dinner and you may think, you know, I'm away from downtown, I'm away from the protest. Businesses were taking precautions on all sides of town, closing down at around seven o'clock uh, to give them time to get home, to make the curfew, to give their employees time to get home and just to make sure that they are abiding by the rules and making sure that they are contributing to what the mayor is asking for everyone to be off of the streets from 9 p.m until sunrise so i thought that that was interesting it was my first time seeing how beyond downtown was being impacted by the curfew absolutely and you know what uh, my wife was telling me that she was up in the alpharetta area and uh, she noticed that some of the businesses were closing sooner some barricades were set up and this is a long ways right about a 30 minute drive depending upon traffic sometimes 40 minute drive from downtown atlanta where folks are concerned you can feel it it's just as thick as that tear gas right now just the tension that is taking place as this con these protests continue on to unfold i mean whether it's right here in metro atlanta or as other parts of the country. And we do understand that Hope Ford has recovered and she is uh, ready to go back live now on the ground. Hope, tell us how you're doing first of all and what you're seeing where you are. Uh, we're, we're doing okay, my, the, the entire crew here is doing okay. We had to take a little break. That was probably, um, that was the most tear gas that uh, I personally witnessed at one time and that we personally were um, took in. So we, uh, we were just overwhelmed by it. Um, just to kind of tell you how much tear gas was uh, deployed, there were several National Guardsmen who actually, they all have gas masks on. Gas masks on. A couple, there were a few that had to take off their masks. They were also overwhelmed um, by gas and they had to come back to this little area back here to get, have water poured into their eyes and things like that. So, um, so what, what happened a few minutes ago as that curfew uh, took off uh, into effect, um, protesters started running from Centennial uh, Olympic Park in Marietta towards, you know, away from, from that area. And for the first time um, since I've been out here since Friday, the first time I witnessed, there was actually another line of Georgia National Guardmen waiting on the other side. And I saw a lot of protesters who were kind of, uh, who, who ran up on that and weren't expecting that. And so they were kind of blocked in. So they, they were corralling them to go to a different area. Um, there was a lot of confusion. There were a lot of people running that in a different direction who saw another line of Georgia National Guard turned around and tried to run, you know, find some way to, to get away from them. And, uh, and we got caught in that. We got, so we got caught in between two lines of police and Georgia National Guard. So we were blocked in. There was a lot of tear gas that was thrown. Um, and so we had to run away from that. A couple of guards members took us aside, told us to put our heads down as all that gas. Um, all that gas was deployed. And so uh, here we are now. We saw a couple of arrests. Um, we can't really see right now if there's a, you can see that line of Georgia guards, guardsmen up there. That was the line that we kind of got stuck in between. And so um, there were a couple of protesters that they did take behind that line and arrest. Um, and so far right now, everything's, uh, everything's clear downtown right now. All right, Hope Ford, thank you so much. We're gonna get back to uh, where Chinu Her is down there. Uh, Chinu, what are things looking like where you are? Can you see that the crowds are dispersing as a result of that tear gas being fired off? Yeah, Aisha, right now, uh, no no people here, no protesters, but uh, you just see a lot of the military uh, and police heading back uh, up Centennial Olympic Park towards the CNN Center. Um, we did see a couple of people uh, get um, uh, walk up this way with police. They were arrested. Um, but for, for other than that, there were just a few arrests that we saw. And then now it looks like uh, they're all heading back up there. Things are clearing up, as you uh, heard from Hope there. From her end, it looks like things are clear. And right now, for the most part, uh, law enforcement and military just heading back up the street. Doesn't appear that there are any protesters or any other people in sight here. 
uh, besides uh, law enforcement. So uh, for the most part, things are clear. It looks like they're going to just gather up here for a little bit. Um, and that's about it. The park, they've had that, the actual park closed off all day. So it doesn't seem like there are people in there. Uh, so for the most part out here, just the military and police still. Guys. All right, Chanu, thank you so much. Now, Ron, each night on night five, what's your assessment of the approach for night five? It's been different every single night. Today, it took less than 30 seconds to move yeah, in. Yeah, when you look at the... Con I know, so look, look at the contrast. Let's start from the beginning. When you and I first, from day one, right, we were covering the protests right there in front of CNN, officers taking bottles and rocks, and they were just kind of batting it down and kind of overlooking all of that because APD did not expect all of this to take place. They really didn't. I mean, they were out of position, didn't have, have the manpower. Now, that was back then. They had bicycle officers. You know, they had the troops out there as well, but not as many as they have tonight. So here you are, what is this, day five? Here you are five days later, and it's a huge army out there now taking on the protesters. Different scenario because they're using overwhelming force, and they're not waiting. As soon as they put out the word, curfew is here, we're firing the tear gas, we're coming at you, and now they're taking another strategy, and Hope Ford even talked about this, where when the protesters were able to walk, run away and get away, from the officers and get away from the National Guard members there, they ran into another wall of National Guard members, forcing them to go down another road, or as our very own Jeff Hollinger calls it, shepherding them down another road. And so it seems like the National Guard, APD, state troopers, all the mutual aid officers, they have a lot more control. But here's the problem, Aisha. Here's the challenge for them tonight. We're hearing about looting in other parts of Metro Atlanta. They're going to have to send out some kind of strike force, you know, from different agencies to go deal with that. But downtown looks pretty locked down right now. Yeah, and we see them uh, all moving in the same direction right now. And it, you know, they have these different areas set up. And that's why when that crowd tried to go in a different direction and run away, they really seem to master um, now on day five, Ron, locking down those different areas because in nights past we saw that the crowd would just sort of congregate in a different area and that really took a lot longer and it's especially with the streets still being open too uh, throughout downtown so tonight seems like they have much more control in many different areas controlled not allowing people to uh, get through easily yeah and, and think about this, you're talking about waves and waves of National Guardsmen, waves of them. Not just one line, one skirmish line with maybe a few arresting officers behind them with the zip ties. No, we're talking about squad after squad after squad who are coming at you and they're forcing you in different directions. Um, you know, because the governor talked about this during his press conference today, and I know I've mentioned this before, especially for those who may be joining us. He says that we're not going to let the agitators to wear us out. We are not going to be worn down. We want folks to come out and protest and show their passion for the injustice that's taking place across our country, but you will not break the law in Georgia because we will make sure that we match that intensity with force. Ron, when people ask the question, well, how long do you think the protesters are going to come out there? Or, you know, how long do you think this is going to go on? What do you say to that? Because Governor Kemp has said they are willing to, you know, stick this thing out through through the long haul. Do you feel like people are getting to the point where they feel like they've, they're being heard? Because I do think we've seen an increase of people having those conversations during the protests with law enforcement. We didn't see that for the first couple of days. It was very heated. Now they're able to have exchanges. You know, I think it's just like with any type of diplomacy, as long as you have communication, it opens up the possibility of you guys coming to some sort of agreement. And the agreement that I'm seeing across the country, because I'm also monitoring what's taking place in other cities across the country, is some of the officers are now coming out kneeling with the protesters talking with the protesters, praying with the protesters, hugging the protesters. So now you have that common ground. And so 
That's what community policing is all about. So even before all of this, that's why police agencies are encouraged to get involved in community policing. In other words, get out of that patrol car, walk around, shake some hands, meet the store owners, talk to the neighbors, begin to build that rapport and trust. And the moment that you begin to build that trust and the neighbors or the, or the protesters feel like they have a dialogue, that they're actually being heard, it makes the job easier for law enforcement. But as soon as you close everything off, you know, and you're just in your patrol car going from call to call to call, making that a priority instead of connecting with the community, you're going, it's going to make your job a whole lot more difficult. And we've been hearing from city leaders. Let's hear from a city council member, Antonio Brown. We spoke to him earlier today before the curfew went into effect, Ron. Yeah, it's just basically simple. This, this is a peaceful protest, and we're not going to allow agitators to infiltrate this crowd and disrupt it and turn it into chaos and confusion. Our APD are standing with us. They've kneeled here today to show the unity. And we need to come together and move forward together. I've asked this crowd to disperse so that they can all go home in time for the curfew so that we can eventually not have a curfew in this city and we can be peaceful as we continue to protest. One of the most powerful movements I've seen, uh, moments that I've seen in, over the past few days is, is when you started speaking, this entire crowd, hundreds of people, they silenced and uh, some of them even, they knelt at one point, the entire crowd. How powerful was that to finally see an entire uh, crowd of people be unified? It was a powerful moment and it's a necessary moment for this time. As we continue to fight against the injustices, we have to be united. We have to stand together. And for me, this crowd is me. This is, I, I come from a lot of the environments and conditions in which they come from. So we have to stand together. We have to move this movement forward, but we have to do it with action. And what I'm trying to teach is that there's a way to organize. There's a way to organize peaceful protesting where we can demand solutions to these issues of our government and elected officials. As an elected official, I understand what is necessary to move this conversation forward into a place of action. Very passionate words there uh, from City Council Member Antonio uh, Floyd there, um, Antonio Brown, excuse me. Really saying, you know, the purpose of this is to remain peaceful and to allow their voices uh, to be heard. But at the same time, they are acknowledging that there are agitators in the crowd. And Ron, how do you really separate the two? Because when you fire off tear gas, you don't know who is who. You just have to do the methods that you know will work to disperse the crowd. Well, you know what, if the reports are true, all across our country and all the various cities that many of these folks who are agitators are not Atlantans. They're not from Chicago. They're not from LA. These are outsiders who just are looking for an opportunity. This is according to the governor, according to the mayor, and also according to the police chief. These are folks just looking for an opportunity. So it, it, it's beyond according to them. It's beyond George Floyd. It's beyond um, uh, Ahmad Arbery. I mean, it's beyond all of that. This is just an opportunity for them to wreak havoc within these communities. And I'm beginning to see, and I'm sure you are too, in these different communities where uh, public officials, even celebrities are saying, hey, we're with you, let's protest, but don't burn down our city. So I know that they're gathering a lot of intel in all the various cities to find out if these folks are actually residents, like especially here in Metro Atlanta, are these folks who are, are committing these crimes and all this violence, are the majority of them, are they from Atlanta? And, you know, they may not be able to get that answer in the next few days, in the next few weeks. But until then, it just it appears that the National Guard, APD, everybody is going to be out there to deal with it, whether they're from Atlanta or from somewhere else. So, Ron, with this level of response, do you think that it is agitating the crowd to see this amount of National Guard and law enforcement, but it seems like that was the only way to corral the crowd. So how do you find the balance between that? You know, I don't know how you're going to find the balance. I think that APD at this point has the perfect strategy. You get your bicycle unit up there. 
you know, they're non-threatening. They got the fluorescent jackets. They got the bicycle helmets, and they're trying to engage the crowd, trying to get some supporters in there. You try to do that, but if it gets to the point where you're going to have agitators who are still hell bent on creating or committing crimes, throwing rocks and bottles and whatever else may be in that bottle, it may not just be water, as we've talked about before, throwing knives, as the chief of police indicated, firing gunshots within the city of Metro Atlanta, you're going to have to meet force with force. But your force, if I'm a, a police commander or whatever, is going to have to be overwhelming force. So the balance I mean, the delicate balance, I agree, it's just hard. How do you do that? But I think what they're doing, which appears to be working, is, as a city council member said before, getting out there, kneeling with the protesters, speaking with them, and trying to open up some communication. Let's get back on the ground now to Hope for uh, very insightful information there, Ron. Uh, let's get back to Hope to see what she's seeing. We are 27 minutes into curfew, Hope. Yeah, Aisha, uh, everyone's, from what we can see back here, uh, near the Ferris wheel on Centennial Olympic Park, just to give you kind of an idea of where we are, um, everyone, we haven't seen any protesters. It's just been Georgia National Guard out here um, for the past what, 27 minutes. I do want to kind of point you out to see those, um, those gates that are kind of pulled down uh, right there. Whenever the protesters were trying to run down here and they met with another line of Georgia National Guardsmen, some of them were trying to climb over that. Um, to get away from um, from tear gas that was uh, being thrown at that point in time, so that's why you see that right there. But it's been it's been calm for the last 27 minutes. Again, um, protesters, a, a large majority of them, you know, 95% of them were probably gone well before a curfew, and that's because there the organizers were going through the crowd at about you know for 8:30. You heard the organizers going through the crowd. There were um, volunteers in yellow shirts with the word organizer on the back. They were riding bikes around and they were you know kind of giving people a reminder: Hey, it's 8:30. It's time to go home. The organizers have already left. You know, let's do this all again tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. So a large portion you know were able to you know come down here peacefully protest for quite a few hours and then uh, make back home and there were you know a handful of people that were still uh, left out here once that nine o'clock curfew hit but uh, right now all we've been seeing is, is Georgia National Guardsmen uh, where we are um, and again that's close to the Ferris wheel right there uh, hope interesting question for you uh, people were you know having the discussion of uh -huh. uh, how long are people going to do this and you said the message down there is we'll see you tomorrow Oh, yeah. And I actually had a, a couple of conversations with a couple of protesters um, and said, you know, um, it's day five. You know, a lot of them, it was their first day and they were excited to be down here because they'd seen it on social media. They'd seen it on uh, on the on the news and they were excited to come down here and take part of it. A lot of them were saying, you know, I was out of town. Um, I met a couple of people who were at the L.A. protest and were coming back to Atlanta with their hometown and decided to, to stay heat to, to come to this one. So there were a lot of first timers out there uh, that I talked to tonight and they were excited and they were invigorated and they said, you know, you know, they heard those conversations in the crowd. They're going, okay, where are we going tomorrow? Are we meeting at the Capitol? Or are we meeting back here? So uh, there were a lot of those conversations, and I feel um, from the, the vibe of the crowd that as long as you know they can continue to come together and 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 you know have those protests, um, that you know they'll keep coming back as long as you know as long as there's people to join with them. All right, Hope, thank you so much. What is the status of the crowd right now? It doesn't seem like we're seeing any protesters. What do you think about the uh, exit strategy for tonight? Uh, there definitely aren't uh, any protesters uh, in this area. Um, again, we're off. We're on Centennial Olympic Park. Uh, we haven't seen any protesters in the last uh, 27 minutes. Um, that, that exit strategy, um, it, they, it, it looks like they were trying to corral them to go to in a specific area to, to get everyone to go, you know, in, in one area. The thing that I think a lot of people th weren't um, ready for is this was, at least for me, this, that was the first time I'd seen that. That was the first time that w when we came further down Centennial Olympic Park towards the Ferris wheel, that was the first time that we were met with another line of Georgia National Guardsmen. So you saw a lot of people that were running toward that area and they, you know, because that was the, the route they were used to taking, and they saw that, 
and then they had to turn around and go, uh, you know, turn around and go away. That caused a little bit of panic um, from some people. Uh, so, and, and it did, it, we end up getting, getting uh, caught in between that, in between that panic, in between those two lines, and that's when, um, you know, tear gas was being uh, deployed at that point in time. So the protesters have cleared out pretty quickly. Um, there is no marching down the street, as we've seen um, night after night, uh, march where the, the pro, uh, excuse me, where the, the guard and police were marching down the street trying to move protesters back. Instead, this time, they corralled them all into one area so that everyone could go, um, could go in one area and they weren't splitting off into several different groups. All right, Hope for thank you. Ron, now we see the uh, officers and the National Guard members on these ATV units just going around the area to double and triple check to make sure that the protesters uh, are out of there. What is the difference here, you know, once night falls and once, you know, they allow them to stay so long and it goes peaceful, but they have to turn it up, Ron. They, they don't have a choice. If the curfew is in effect, they have been given clear instructions. Yeah, they have no other choice. And just looking at the National Guard members there, they're, they're the military. So these are the same folks that go to Iraq, they go to Afghanistan, they go and they deal in, in, in a combat situation. This is what they do. Obviously, they're here in Atlanta, but they were able to go to foreign countries and deal with an enemy in a deadly way. I am positive that they sat up and they came up with a strategy. They said that they, they look in terms, and I'm not calling them the enemy, but they probably look in terms of these agitators are the enemy. How do we suppress them? What military maneuvers do we do to make sure that we squeeze them and push them out? And so they probably had their maps all laid out. The commanders did. Maybe it's the general with his colonels and with his captains. And they come up with a strategy along with APD of how do we corral them? How do we squeeze them? How do we push them out? And how do we do it effectively within minutes? Think about this, Aisha. From the first night, it was hours and hours and hours before they were able to get things under control. And it really was not under control. This situation, everybody's on stand down, got their mask off, chilling, talking about maybe what they're going to be doing coming up this weekend, taking selfies, taking pictures, because they, they were able to diffuse this thing within minutes because they had a strategy of overwhelming force. And that militaristic strategy for now appears to be working. All right, it does appear to be working. No protesters in sight. Back on the ground now with 11 Alive, Chinu Her. Chinu, where are you? And tell us, what are you seeing in your area? Yeah, Aisha, right now, um, it looks like they're winding down. It looks like law enforcement is getting everything uh, ready to wind down. There are no protesters out this way anymore. This is right at the intersection of Centennial Olympic Park Drive and Marietta Street, uh, right in front of the CNN Center. Uh, all of the law enforcement now are winding down. They're just uh, getting everything situated. It looks like some of them are, are already, they got some of their gear off and they're uh, sitting down over there. But for the most part, it looks like everything here is wrapping up. We're only about 35 minutes after the curfew and uh, police and law enforcement have been able to get everyone out of here. Um, as, you hope, uh, as you heard Hope say, uh, there aren't any protesters on the end where she's at as well. So it looks like they cleared things out pretty quickly uh, uh, tonight. And earlier we did speak to a protester and this is what they had to say. It's important to be out here because my son was afraid to come out. And I had to explain to him that it's very important to come out here to show your support because this could be him. This could be his brothers. I have 13 children together. We're a blended family. We have 13 children. And it's very important to support our black brothers to let them know that despite what's going on, we're here for them. And I want him to see and be a part of this movement that when things do change, that it's important that he was a part of this. So I wanted him to know how important that was, both of them, to know how important that was. I would just have the conversation with them that it's just important to be, to stand together, have the conversation with them. You can't shelter them from it. It's important to talk to them, to let them know what's important and to just stand for something. If we don't stand for something, we'll go for anything. And that's what's important. And that's why I felt it was so important to bring him out here so that when he gets older, he can say, my mom fought for something and he can represent something as well. Yeah, Aisha, it is also important to note that for the most part tonight, this 
Uh, this protest was peaceful. There were people handing out water. There were people encouraging others to register to vote. And even as we walked around the crowd, there were people uh, offering us water, talking to us, uh, thanking us for being here and covering this. And it wasn't until uh, the last few minutes right before the curfew uh, went into effect where some people started throwing water bottles into the crowd of law enforcement. And even as that was happening, there were uh, quite a few people who were telling everyone to stop. Uh, but as soon as that started happening, law enforcement started marching forward and they shot tear gas into the crowd but all of that didn't last very long they started pushing the crowd out of here and now as you can see uh, again things are winding down and uh, it looks like they're wrapping everything up uh, here and uh, again we're just uh, a little over 35 minutes past the curfew and it looks like uh, they've wrapped it up and they're winding down now Aisha all right Chinu thank you so much we are glad that Chinu and Hope are safe tonight after Hope took a pretty intense round of tear gas out there. They moved in just about 30 seconds after the nine o'clock hour. I mean, this was as soon as curfew went into effect, the earliest that we've witnessed in that. National Guard. A lot of nights we saw that the National Guard or even uh, when it was just police that they were outnumbered. We see their presence increasing night after night, moving in swiftly and quickly. And then that is when the crowd started to disperse. This was just about nine o'clock in 30 seconds, not, you know, letting it go. It was very surprising uh, how long they allowed the crowds to uh, stay out there in uh, protest. Really a huge drastic difference from the first night to night five. A welcome sight for a lot of people. A lot of people got out, exercised their right to peacefully protest, but you can't continue to peacefully protest if the mayor of the city puts in a curfew, Ron. So it's sort of, you know, they're saying, you know, this is our right, but if there is an ordinance in place, then that sort of trumps everything. Yeah, you got to follow that ordinance and just look at the mass amount of troops that are pushing their way through. You know, this is video that was recorded earlier and you said it was just 30 seconds into the curfew. And then there was a mass amount of troops behind that mass amount of troops. But, you know, to Chinu's point, he says that he heard some of the protesters, and this is before all this took place, when they saw some of the folks throwing rocks and bottles or throwing objects, that they were telling them to stop, trying to keep them from sparking the violence. But that shows you the importance of diplomacy, how to, how to speak, how to try to connect if those officers who are on the front line, whatever you can do to find supporters to keep the violence from continuing throughout the night. If you have protesters telling other protesters, put that down, stop throwing the rocks, stop throwing the bottles, stop throwing projectiles, then you have won the diplomacy battle, so to speak. Now you're opening up the dialogue. And look at that. Look at this here, uh, um, Aisha, how, how the National Guardsmen are coming from one part. See how they're doing that? They're boxing them in. Hope Ford talked about that. Here they're coming up from the top, and at the bottom of the screen, you have some folks pushing them from the bottom, the troops from the bottom, squeezing them in and forcing them in one direction. All right, we're listening. Uh, uh, let's, uh, where did you say we were going to go next? All right, so we have Hope uh, live on the ground right now. We're trying to get direction from producers to see exactly where we're going to take you during this live continuous coverage. Let's get to Hope Ford. Yeah, Aisha. Um, so with the crowds that were out here tonight, uh, obviously there was a lot of people out here and uh, you see all the Georgia National Guard out here right now. But uh, this is what we couldn't see uh, earlier today. Um, these crosses. Don't know how long they've been out here, but they do have flowers on them. Some of that have can uh, candles, um, and they have names on them. And you'll recognize these names: Trayvon Martin, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, George Floyd, Tamir Rice, Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, Botham Jean, Eric Gardner, and it goes all the way down Alton Sterling. And here at the end, right here, is Maude Arbery, who. Uh, we know that Brunswick case. So we couldn't see this earlier today with the crowd that was out here. So we can't tell you how long it's been out here. But um, people have been coming up to me all day today and, you know, saying that it's important that people remember that this is the reason why they're coming out here. 
every single day is for these people and for and for justice so that is so we want to give you a, a look at that because we couldn't see this at all all day um, because there was there was such a large crowd out here protesting and then in the in the in the chaos of everything kind of trying to get away we didn't see that either but as we were walking back up um, we saw this and we definitely wanted to, to show you this to you because so many protesters out here um, today have been continuously coming up to us and, and saying you know remember this is the reason why we're protesting out here and uh, right now you can see ATVs moving in the background uh, right now as the as the troops kind of go back to their to their headquarters to kind of um, block off this whole downtown area for the next uh, for the next couple of hours now so I uh, wanted to give you a, a look at that because um, we had just walked up and there's even this one right here in the middle that uh, that just says simply no more so I did want to uh, just just kind of call that attention and and and, and show that uh, for a moment because it again this was something that we missed all day because uh, because of just the massive amount of, of people who were out here protesting and hope I think that's a very interesting perspective because while we have been saying surrounding these current protests we've been saying three main names George Floyd Ahmaud Albury and Breonna Taylor out of Louisville Kentucky People are not just out there in the name of one, two, or three names. It is that list that you just showed, and believe it or not, the list is actually bigger than that. So as, do you think that that speaks to the level of emotion that we're seeing out there? It's, it's not about one person. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and, a lot, and I've heard a lot of organizers, a lot of protesters say, you know, throughout this, past few days you know they'll say George Floyd's name and then they'll go they'll say right after that remember this isn't this is for George Floyd but remember you know Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and they'll start listing off those names I've seen plenty of people out here with signs uh, that said you know there are too many names to list on this sign and that's a shame so I think that or not that I think I know from the conversations at least that I've had with uh, many people out here is that they they are they don't, they're not just carrying the memory of the George Floyd video they're carrying the memory of all of these people I'm sorry respectfully our hope for uh, hope Ford has been on the ground for five days now in the middle of pure emotion she is a journalist but she is first of all a human being she has taken tear gas for our coverage she has endured intense moments out there with such professionalism. We thank Hope for her dedication and uh, for bringing us this coverage, Hope. This is just so eye-opening, and I love the fact that we're just now seeing it, like we uncovered this hidden gem that says so much. Yeah, and um, like I said, I don't know how long it's, uh, it's been here today. I was seeing a lot of people walking around with flowers, and I, uh, I kept wondering, why do they have flowers in their hands? And now I'm seeing all of these flowers. Hope for it. down out here, so. Hope, respectfully, we yeah. are going to give you a minute, and we can let your photojournalist uh, tell the story. You guys are an awesome team. We can let Tyson tell the story. Sometimes the video tells the story. We don't always have to force ourselves into a moment under the name of professionalism because again, we are first and foremost human. This has been uh, very heart wrenching for all of us on all sides. We wear many hats and we wear those hats proudly, but at the same time, we cannot deny how this moment has made so many people feel. As journalists, sometimes we see the video more than anyone and we see, you know, different sides of this thing and we have to bring this to you in a very balanced and, you know, and fair manner because it is the job that we signed up for. But when you see a row of crosses, Ron, with that many names and to know the story behind it, it is what it is. It really is what it is, and it can be very emotional. And you know, this was a, a good, this was a good example of you know, even though we are journalists, we have to be objective and just kind of tell the story and not get emotionally involved. But we do, 
Man, when I saw the video being a former cop, former sergeant out of the Oakland Police Department in California, and I saw what was taking place with George Floyd, and just not to wear my journalism hat, but I'm yelling at the screen, get off of him, get off of him. And you have all these other officers that are surrounding him, and you know, he's calling out to his mom and, and, um, and saying, I can't breathe. And, and so I, I know we're, we're supposed to be objective, and, and I get that, and we, and we are not subjective, but sometimes you feel close to the story, more close to the story maybe than other people do. And being a former cop and seeing how all that was played out, it was emotional for us. I mean, I end up contacting a lot of my uh, law enforcement friends, some of them who retired out here in Georgia, some folks who live out there in California, and we just had some, some really heated discussions, not debate, but heated discussions about what had taken place in Minneapolis. And um, so I, I can understand how, how Hope feels, that she wants to report, she wants to be able to tell that story, but sometimes the human side of you comes out and um, because the story takes is a lot more deeper than than what we see on the surface as journalists and sometimes even the community feels that you don't get a break think about the succession of how these events came into place you have Breonna Taylor well Ahmaud Albury happened in February but it took 74 days for even an arrest then Breonna Taylor and then George Floyd so it is the pressure of not being able to take a breather to see how one case is going to play out. Even the law team that is representing in a lot of these cases, they're working all three. So put that into perspective that they're flying all over the country. They were in the forefront yesterday with the two students from uh, Morehouse and Spellman, and then they flew to be with the mother and daughter of George Floyd. A lot of people that are right in the thick of this thing, including the protesters, feel stretched to the point of no return. And we want to let people know when you see things get intense, that's that stretching just reaching a boiling point. Let's hear from one of the protesters on the ground earlier today before curfew went into effect. I felt the need to come down because I have two black brothers and I have two black nieces and it pains me at night when I think about the possibilities. And I came down here to show support for my people because I believe in something better than this. This isn't what's supposed to be and this isn't what's supposed to happen. They shouldn't be pointing guns at their own citizens. We are United States citizens. We are in the United States. This is United States military. They shouldn't be pointing their guns at us. We are their citizens. We are them. That's why I came out here. These possibilities I'm afraid of is my brothers and my nieces getting shot, being unarmed. I'm afraid of them growing up in a place where they can't get fair education, where they can't get fair wages. These are the possibilities. It's deeper. It's deeper than physical. It's deeper than just a gunshot. This is institutionalized. This is something that is grained deep into our system. This isn't something that's on the surface. This right here is just the surface. There's so much more that we should be doing. This moment that you're seeing here right now is video that Hope Ford tweeted out between the six and seven o'clock hour of all of the protesters, a crowd that large coming together, taking a knee for a moment of silence. Fists in the air, signs in the air. You see all different hues, all different shades of fists in the air, all different nationalities coming together peacefully. We're back live now looking at the scene downtown Atlanta. And Ron, this is that moment where you said they're sort of, you know, taking that breather knowing that the method to move in tonight was successful. And we also have to note, Ron, that this was a response to something that the city had to get a hold of because of the level of violence and uh, looting and damage that we saw Friday night. The mayor had to respond, Chief Shields right. had and, to respond. Know, absolutely, and you know, the other thing too is you have to protect 
people to. So in the melee, in the looting, in the violence, in the vandalism, you know, you want to make sure that no one is hurt. You want to make sure that you don't have to pull the trigger on anyone, that you don't have to enact any type of deadly force or, or anything like that. So the best thing to do is to have overwhelming force. And you know, Aisha, you talked about just the, the emotion, the thickness of the, the disgust and passion just taking place all across the country. But just imagine if we did not have social media. Just imagine if we still had scheduled television. The only time that you can find out what's going on around the United States is at 6 o'clock, no, not 6 o'clock newscast. But because of social media, because of video, because of instant information that we're able to share with everyone, just like Hope was able to share some of that Twitter video, and, and you compile all three of those incidents and other things that may be happening across the country, that also makes it really difficult for a lot of people to process. I know that you knew her, he's still alive on the scene. And the last time we checked with him in downtown Atlanta, it was pretty quiet, pretty much the same, Chinu. Yeah, Ron, still the same thing here. Um, it's been uh, quiet uh, for the last several minutes now since everyone was cleared out. And again, uh, you know, the law enforcement are winding things down. Many of them are now sitting down. And, uh, you know, I, so some, one thing I've noticed, Ron, is that, I mean, many of them look exhausted. They've been out here all day. Um, I've seen them out here, whether it's manning the park, some of them uh, standing guard. They've been out here all day, and you know you can see some of them just sitting on the ground there. Um, again, they're winding down now after pushing everyone out of the park. Um, they're all the way up and down the street here on Centennial Olympic Park still, uh, from the CNN Center all the way down the block, still kind of just manning everything. Some are still walking around in the park there. It looks like they might still uh, just be just making sure that no one's in there. But for the most part, yeah, things are pretty quiet here, Ron. Uh, they, it looks like they got it cleared out pretty quick, half an hour at the most, um, right as the curfew hit. Uh, they started clearing everyone out. So for the most part right now, you see they're winding down. Um, they're starting to get some rest out here uh, on, on, the, on the street. Um, yeah, and for the most part, things are starting to really, really quiet down, uh, down here. And it looks like they cleared everyone out pretty quickly, Ron. Yeah, you know what, Aisha, too, um, prior to all of this, everything's, as far as emotion, it starts at zero. Then all of a sudden, you get closer to curfew, emotion rise to 100, right? So you just immediately go from this lull of waiting and anticipating to immediate you get involved in the conflict and get involved in the action, and then once again, the adrenaline drops, and now it's time to chill. But the other thing that you, I want to point out real quick is, prior to all of this, Aisha, they're like in the classroom, just trying to figure out this is going to be the game plan before we get out. So they, this is really long hours for them, and they're, when we're done with our broadcast, they're going to probably continue to do what they're doing until late into the evening, early morning hours. Yeah, Ron, and like you said, you can't get that false sense of security because we see how that turned out on Saturday night and you don't want people to, you know, pop back up after the curfew because it is a zero tolerance policy in regards to, you know, making those arrests if anyone is out. We do want to clear this up, though, Ron. Last night we had some interesting comments and even thinking about us. OK, I'm at work. I have a job. I may be a second shifter and I need to get home. Am I going to be in trouble for being on the streets? All work related activities are permitted and that's why you know we've been seeing the billboards all over town making sure that everyone is aware of the curfew but we understand it's 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 common courtesy that life does go on and like I mentioned to you earlier Ron a lot of restaurants closed up shop early making sure that they were in compliance and didn't run into problems with you know their staff or anyone being out because they were at work so even from the employment aspect, a lot of people got around that. Yeah, I guess uh, if I if I were working downtown, I couldn't tell my boss, hey, listen, I can't continue to work because of the curfew. It's just something that uh, continues to move on. Here's the good news here, based upon what we're seeing with this video, Aisha. It's really nice and quiet, and hopefully it remains that way. And when protesters come out tomorrow, once again, they can display their passion. They can continue to voice their opinion and uh, be able to connect with city leaders and also with the police department, but do it in a peaceful and responsible way. We hope that everyone stays safe uh, as they continue to express their concerns and outrage across the country. 
And we are going to stick with you throughout the 10 o'clock hour on 11 Alive News in prime time here on the ATL. We are seeing a very calm night right now as the curfew has been in effect for nearly one hour. We are sticking with you through this live coverage, bringing you this story from all sides and all angles. We're going to give you a recap of the day. What's been happening and what's next? Stick with us. The 10 o'clock newscast in prime time rolls on. Or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Most of downtown is clear tonight after hours of protests in the streets. It is now one hour after the 9 p.m. curfew issued in Atlanta for the fourth night in a row. This is a view of the scene right after curfew. Just an hour ago, we saw those protesters out there peacefully standing face to face with members of the National Guard in about 30 seconds after curfew, Jeff. And just after that, our Hope Ford was live at the scene. When law enforcement tear gassed the crowd, the police and the National Guard were working to clear the streets moments after curfew. You can see Hope and the crew rushing, hurrying, trying to get out of harm's way. They were successful in doing so and they were not injured. This is a look at the scene now much calmer. We see the National Guard members uh, resting on their shields along the sides of the road lining downtown. Hope this is a welcome sight, especially after the heaviest round of tear gas you endured over the past five days. That got pretty intense. 
Yeah, it did get intense for a moment there. We uh, It was the first time where the National Guard were kind of flanked both sides and uh, they were trying to corral protesters to go into a certain area. Uh, we didn't know that. A lot of the protesters who were still here at that time did not know that. Uh, so we ran right into the middle of uh, that. As people were getting confused, they didn't know where to go. Um, and there was a lot of tear gas being deployed. There were, uh, what you saw there in that, that hectic scene, there were a lot of tear gas cans that landed right at our feet. And there were also people who were trying to run and get away from it as well. So that's kind of what you saw there earlier uh, tonight. But what we see out here, uh, it's been clear for the last uh, really since nine o'clock uh, at this point just georgia national guard and police officers who are who are still out here a lot a large majority of the protesters uh, were gone by nine o'clock uh, anyway so uh, it was just a very small portion that they uh, that they needed to to disperse for that nine o'clock curfew um, and, and one thing that we weren't able to see all day because of the, there was, I mean, there were probably three groups of protesters that met up here today. It's probably one of the largest crowds I've seen since this weekend. But um, one of the things that we weren't able to see because there were so many people out here protesting were these 16 crosses. And these 16 crosses are out here and they have names that I'm pretty sure uh, you're familiar with. Maud Arbery, Alton Sterling, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, uh, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin. There's one in the middle that says no more. These crosses out here are the reason several, many people I talked to today said, this is the reason why we're protesting. This is the reason we're going to keep coming back to protest. Uh, and this is the reason why uh, we want to come together and have our voices heard. I spoke with uh, one protester here who was out here on the, the megaphone several times today talking to the crowd. Take a listen to what he had to say. Just want to make sure our voices are heard. You know, there's a lot of people that don't really understand why we are out here. And there's a lot of conflicting agendas. You know, so I kind of just wanted to put it all together and let people know we're, we're not angry at the police. We are angry at police brutality. We are angry, angry at systematic racism. You know, and, and as, as, long as, as long as we can, you know, we'll be out here to make sure that our voices are heard and hopefully change will come from it. And again, those names that you saw right there on those crosses, that was a, a lot of the names I saw on people's shirts and saw out here on signs here today. And that was a lot of the reason that people say, you know, it's day five. I heard a lot of people going, all right, it's 8.30, time to go home, and we'll see you back out here tomorrow. Um, and a lot of conversations about from people saying, you know what, we're going to continue to come back until we get our message across. We're going to continue to, some people are saying we're going to continue to come back because they just enjoy feeling the sense of community uh, that they're getting from everyone that's that's around them who are, you know, sharing in that message with them. So um, we can probably plan to see more people out here at Centennial Olympic Park and Marietta Street uh, tomorrow in the coming days as this been, has been kind of the beginning and the end of all the protests here over the last five days. All right, Hope for thank you so much. We continue our team coverage tonight with Chinu Her. Chinu has been on the move following protesters downtown throughout the day. Chinu, you were in the thick of it as that crowd dispersed right after nine. Yeah, Aisha, I have been following this crowd for several hours tonight, and as the curfew hit right at 9 o'clock there, this was kind of the epicenter of the protest. And at 9 o'clock, that's when law enforcement started to push everyone down the street here. And around 8.30, uh, I was at the Capitol earlier. Around 8.30, I started to come back here to the park, and pretty much every perimeter uh, that you could uh, think of around the park here uh, law enforcement had it blocked off. They were letting people leave, but not allowing uh, people to get back in. Uh, so at that moment, uh, law enforcement warned people that that uh, the uh, curfew was about to hit and they started pushing people out at nine. So right now things are winding down. Law enforcement uh, are starting to just get everything situated. If you look up, uh, well, actually behind this vehicle here, uh, you can see a lot of the law enforcement uh, officials and the military um, sitting over there. They, they seem exhausted. They've been here all night. Uh, they've been here all day uh, since we've been here as well. We've seen them all around this area, manning the park, manning the streets, and they got everyone out of here pretty quickly. So right now, again, things are just winding down. There aren't any more people down this way. But earlier, uh, as we were following the groups, they, they split up, and then at one point, uh, they all kind of met back here and the crowd instantly doubled. So the, the, all the law enforcement you see here were dealing with those crowds and had to eventually at the curfew, 
push most of them out down the street. But it didn't take long, about half an hour before they were able to clear everyone. So as you can see now, this is all that's left uh, here uh, at Centennial Olympic Park in downtown Atlanta. Uh, everything's cleared for now. Shanu, are they allowing traffic through right now? Uh, is there a, a, a number of cars or is it for the most part just uh, law enforcement that we're seeing? Yeah, that's a good question, Jeff. Right now, uh, it doesn't seem like they're allowing any traffic to come through. Uh, I'm not sure if this vehicle uh, is a civilian vehicle or with uh, law enforcement. I saw uh, that gentleman right there walking with uh, uh, law enforcement earlier. Um, and so the vehicle is leaving the area. But no, like other than that, there have been no vehicles coming in and out of this area all day. So as we walked earlier with the crowds, pretty much at every entry point into this, this, this area of downtown, law enforcement had blocked off. So for most of the day, even now, it doesn't seem like vehicles are uh, coming in and out of here, Jeff. Chinu Her reporting from downtown. We'll check in with you in a few minutes, Chinu. Thank you. Appreciate it. Governor Kemp has a message for the men and women in law enforcement saying he is proud of the efforts to keep the protests peaceful. After all of the chaos on Friday night, Ryan Kruger spoke with Governor Kemp about the increased security that he has ordered at the protests. What started as peaceful protests Friday night quickly turned into violence and chaos. Police cars were set on fire, glass was shattered, and the GBI director believes these actions were caused by people looking to make trouble. Based on the information intelligence we have, there are individuals here from various groups around the country, a lot of which are uh, uh, bent primarily on destruction and violence. Authorities wouldn't go into details about where they believe these groups are coming from or what they stand for. Governor Kim says he's working with some of the protest organizers to find the ones that he says have an agenda for violence. I am outraged that Georgians are now in arms way because some are using this moment to riot, to loot, and to compromise the safety of our citizenry. Law enforcement is working around the clock and 3,000 National Guard members have been mobilized. Leaders tell me they're doing everything they can to try to prevent fatigue. Fatigue sometimes impairs judgment. The last thing we want is for somebody to be frustrated and fatigued uh, and, and make a bad decision. On Friday, we quickly watched a peaceful protest turn into violence and chaos. Since then, Atlanta police, along with the National Guard, the Georgia National Guard, have increased the force that they are using to control the crowds. And when the 9 p.m. curfews begin, they start making dozens of arrests. Joe Hankey has a look at how they are adapting. On Friday night, we're During a peaceful protest in March from the state capitol building to Centennial Olympic Park, emotions ran high, and then the sun set. Fires, graffiti, and looting from downtown to Buckhead took over the protest. Atlanta police appeared to be caught off guard, and Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms delivered an emotional response. We're no longer talking about the murder of an innocent man. We're talking about how you're burning police cars on the streets of Atlanta, Georgia. Go home. 77 arrests would be made, and in the morning, the cleanup began. On Saturday, Bottoms announced a 9 p.m. curfew. Atlanta police showed up with riot gear. Governor Brian Kemp authorized up to 1,500 Georgia National Guard troops to be deployed, and another crowd of protesters gathered by Centennial Olympic Park. But tear gas pushed protesters back as the curfew hour approached, and then police made dozens of arrests. In total, 157 people would be arrested Saturday, with some business windows smashed, but the damage more limited. On Sunday, another passionate group of protesters gathered, largely peaceful for the most part, as the mayor's office announced a second 9 p.m. curfew. Police and the National Guard held their position, and there were some tense moments as some protesters tried to build a barricade across the street by Centennial. Police used more tear gas than previous nights as the 9 p.m. hour approached to push the crowd back. 64 people would be arrested, and the rest of the crowd left earlier than on Friday or Saturday. On Monday, protesters returned to downtown, and Atlanta police took a knee with the crowd during a peaceful protest. But with a third straight 9 p.m. curfew in place, shortly before 9, tear gas would be thrown at protesters by the park and a crowd by the state capitol building. Police then pushed protesters back and made arrests. The streets of Atlanta only filled with law enforcement by 10 p.m. Today, six Atlanta police officers are facing charges seen on video tasing two college students and pulling them from their car Saturday night. The students say they were not even participating in protests at the time. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has more on the charges and the evidence against those officers.
This incident happened near one of the main entrances of Centennial Olympic Park during a demonstration protesting brutal treatment by police. The young man behind the wheel of this car drew attention from police as he tried to record cell phone video of Saturday's demonstration. He slowly drove up. But Officer Ivory Streeter's body cam video shows Streeter chasing the car. Then body cam video shows another officer hitting the car window with a baton. Then police confront the passenger, Tanaya Pilgrim, who doesn't exit immediately because the car is moving. The video shows Officer Mark Gardner responding with his taser. This is a vicious act. The tasing, uh, it went on for some time uh, while she was uh, shaking and screaming. Seconds later, the driver, Messiah Young, gets the same treatment through a broken car window. He's later thrown to the asphalt, breaking his wrist and opening a gash requiring 21 stitches, according to Fulton DA Paul Howard. And no firearm was ever located in the vehicle. Howard says his office is charging four police officers, Lonnie Hood, Willie Sauls, Ivory Streeter, and Mark Gardner with felony aggravated assault and other charges. Officers Armand Jones and Roland Cloud face lesser charges in the same incident. I feel a little safer now that these monsters are off of the street and no longer able to terrorize anyone else from this point on. I hope every police officer who thinks it's okay to drag someone, beat someone, do all this stuff because they're cops, um, I hope they're all gonna be held accountable as well and be safe everyone, please. APD fired officers Streeter and Gardner the next day. The DA says that the six police officers have until Friday to turn themselves in to the city jail. Coming up after the break, former Democratic gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams weighing in on the protests and unrest that we have seen in Georgia and across the country. After a dry pattern the past few days, we're beginning to see a little more moisture moving in. That's going to slowly increase our rain chances. We're also watching Tropical Storm Cristobal here down in the uh, southern parts of the Gulf in the Bay of Campeche. Stay with us. We'll let you know what happens as this system moves toward the north. As we take you to break, a live look now as the protests continue for another day and another night in Atlanta. The Georgia National Guard in force along Centennial Olympic Park Drive. That is the story of tonight as we are now amidst the curfew. We've been in it now one hour and 14 minutes. We'll be right back. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick cover your cough or sneeze. 
This is a live look right now over downtown Atlanta at Marietta Street and Centennial Olympic Park Drive. We see it is completely clear of protests. As we enter night five, the National Guard and local law enforcement moved in just about 30 seconds after the nine o'clock hour. Jeff, it was the soonest we'd seen that crowd disperse from that mostly peaceful protest today. And it has been one of the larger crowds that we have seen over the course of the last few days. So we will see what tomorrow brings as well. Now on to politics and Stacey Abrams now weighing in on the protests and the unrest that we have seen in our state and across America over the last week. Ms. Abrams says while the killing of George Floyd may have sparked the outcry, the demonstrations signal how little has changed for black Americans. Here's Natisha Lance. Atlanta streets filled with protest and unrest is not an unfamiliar sight to Democrat Stacey Abrams. In 1992, I was a student at Spelman College when the gross decision that exonerated the police officers who on camera beat Rodney King were exonerated. Four Los Angeles police officers charged with excessive use of force were acquitted for the brutal beating of Rodney King. Protests and riots erupted around the country. I led a peaceful protest, but across the street there was violence. That rage, that discomfort, but also that deep sadness that a black man's life did not matter, that's what we're seeing today. Abrams has watched as anger has boiled over again, certain it will continue if political leaders do not take responsibility and action. But what we're asking for is systemic justice to continue the work that I was a part of at the Capitol too often. The law enforcement officers are given carte blanche to use not only their authority, but to do so with impunity. Abrams says reaching these kinds of changes starts with voters. We need to vote not because we get everything we want or deserve, but because we will be the victims constantly if we take ourselves out of the process. Ms. Abrams says a record number, 1.5 million Georgians have now applied for absentee ballots for the primary next Tuesday. Her organization called Fair Fight is working to encourage these people, regardless of party, to return their ballots. We have more information on 11alive.com, how you can make sure that your vote is cast and it is counted. All right, we are switching gears now to check in with Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb. Chris, where are you cooking up for us tonight? I always have to give you props on the suit tie combination, man. I need a lighter moment. I love the suit and tie tonight. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we have so much going on here tonight and the weather is uh, you know, is, is nice out there. We don't have any major weather uh, issues that are going on right now. It's a dry and it's a mild night that we're dealing with. Temperatures in the mid and upper 70s around Metro Atlanta. We do have some lower 70s on the south side right now, like LaGrange is 71. Uh, we have 72 in Covington, uh, some 60s in Blairsville and Clayton, but mainly around the metro area, mid and upper 70s. So it is a mild night out there and it is on the uh, dry side as well. We're going to stay dry overnight. We dip down into the 60s during the uh, early morning hours. Now, one thing though, we are definitely watching and that is Cristobal, which is a brand new tropical storm that developed earlier today. And you can see where it is down here in the Bay of Campeche. We're way up here, but we're going to watch this system. This is the latest forecast track based on the 8 p.m. advisory, and that 8 p.m. advisory does have this storm a little stronger than it was earlier. 45 mile an hour winds. It's going to meander down here in the Bay of Campeche, even going inland for a little bit and losing some strength before it starts moving to the north and gaining strength to the Gulf of Mexico. This is by Saturday afternoon and then Sunday nearing landfall. Uh, and this forecast track keeps it as a tropical storm. However, some of our forecast models show this potential system becoming a hurricane before landfall late on Sunday. So we'll keep watching it. Here are the computer models with that, the spaghetti models. The important thing for us is that we're over here on the right hand side of the center of the storm. And as we are on that right hand side, it's going to start sending some more Gulf moisture our way. Tomorrow we're mainly dry, only a 20% chance for a shower and a high of 88. However, through the period, more of that Gulf moisture is going to come into our area and we'll just see our rain chances Thursday, Friday and Saturday at about 30% with the humidity building mixing in with that heat in the mid and upper 80s. It's Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, depending on 
the exact track of the storm and the intensity of the storm. That will determine how much rain moves our way with temperatures in the low to some mid 80s. Take a look at your weather wow moment of the day. This is from 11 Alive Community Storm Tracker Blake Robb in the Carrollton area. He puts his drone up, gets great videos and pictures he sends us, and this captured the blue sky, mixing in with a few of those clouds with the sunshine in between that. We would love to see your weather wow moment, and uh, we get these a lot of times from our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. You can be a part of that group just on Facebook. Search 11 Alive Storm Trackers, ask to become a member, and you can also share videos, pictures, and weather information with this group. All right, thanks, Chris. We are taking a live look as we head to break. At a very peaceful night here, not much action as we ended night five of protests in downtown Atlanta. National Guard crews and local law enforcement moved in about 30 seconds after that 9 p.m. curfew went into effect. We are live on the ground with our crews. We'll take you back there coming up after the break. You're watching 11 Alive News in prime time. 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jeff Hullinger along with Aisha Howard, and we continue to watch the downtown area that we have for all these many days and nights. Here we are, continuing now into the fifth night in Atlanta. The curfew passing one hour and 24 minutes ago. We continue to see a heavy law enforcement presence as we expect will continue into the early morning hours. This, this curfew will uh, expire at sunrise on Wednesday morning and until then we will see the Georgia National Guard, Atlanta Police, also the Georgia State Patrol also has been seen downtown. So it is a, a full body of Georgia law enforcement to keep those streets free of protesters tonight. People have been taking to the streets of Atlanta for days to get their message across about police brutality and racism. And we want to hear your voice because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. So we asked the question, why do you protest? 
We want to make sure that everybody hears their voices until there's change in this city. We are in this together. Look left and to your right. Look to your brothers and sisters to understand that we are together. Please stand together and do not let anybody diminish you, take you down, or separate you. Because united we stand and divided we fall. So all this looting and throwing rocks and all of that, that's not going to do nothing but make other people rowdy and get other people to die. Y'all don't. Y'all got to understand that. Y'all got to be smart about how you protest. Be intelligent. We're still fighting the same fight we've been fighting since the Civil Rights Act. Nothing's changed. So until I see actual action, no justice, no peace. It means a lot to me because I tell my son to do the, to stay out of trouble, do the best he can. If, I, if I'm not willing to come out here and stand with everybody for him, then, then, then my words to him mean nothing. This is Dr. King's city and his legacy was peace. And I just wanted to be like a small reminder of what it means to protest peacefully. I empathize with the pain of my brothers and sisters. And I also feel like it's important to keep peace at the forefront. People are hurting and I think the people's voices should be heard no matter what because Atlanta is a mecca for civil rights, for freedom, for peace. And I think it's important that people are out here making their voices heard. I think people should be safe and smart about how they protest and keep it as peaceful as possible. And we want to hear why you protest. Give us a call 678-765-9514. Leave us a voicemail there. Also be sure to give us your name and the best way to reach you because we may use some of your messages on air. All right, we have a lot more to share with you during the course of the next 33 minutes. Aisha, will are you leaving preparing for the 11 o'clock broadcast or are you remaining? I'm here. You're here, that's excellent, great news to hear. And we will continue our coverage right here on the ATL, the Big 36, right after this. Ease, clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. 
Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Our continuing coverage now on the ATL 36, and this is downtown Atlanta. Police with their heavy presence tonight, and the, uh, the curfew has been rolling for more than an hour and a half now, Aisha, and this picture really has not changed. It shows force, it shows empty streets, and it shows quiet in downtown Atlanta. A much different scene than what we saw on Friday where we saw a peaceful protest that quickly, quickly turned chaotic. In turn, that led to the heavy military presence given by Governor Kemp and, you know, at the request of Mayor Bottoms and Chief Erica Shields. But we have seen over the past few nights, things have gone peaceful all throughout the day. A little bit of, you know, excess when we got close to that curfew, Jeff, but pretty much it's been smooth here since uh, night two. It has. It's been smooth sailing tonight. And since then, police, along with the Georgia National Guard, have increased the force that they are using to control the crowds. And when the 9 p.m. curfews begin, they start making dozens of arrests. Joe Hankey has a look at how they are adapting. Friday night began with a peaceful protest in March and then unraveled into fires, looting and vandalism. Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms then delivered an emotional speech at a press conference. If you care about a peaceful protest, you're not in the middle of one anymore. So if you want a peaceful protest, go home. The speech marked a change in tone for the city of Atlanta and its police department, who in recent years have handled protests from the sidelines with few arrests and little confrontation. The images from Saturday to Sunday and Monday then looked very similar. Police in riot gear, the National Guard nearby on standby, and protesters facing police in the street. There would be peaceful moments of marching and police taking a knee with the crowd. There were also brief moments of people throwing items at police. But each night at minutes before 9 p.m. curfews, tear gas filled the air, police pushed back the protesters, and arrests began. The streets cleared earlier and earlier each night, with only police and the Georgia National Guard left by 10 p.m. on Monday night. All right, let's check in with Hope Ford right now and hope a, a relatively quiet night uh, in downtown Atlanta right now, aside from what you experienced with a flurry of activity shortly after the curfew. It has been quiet ever since. Yeah, that's right, Jeff. Uh, right now, there's uh, where we are again at the corner of Centennial, Olympic Park, and Marietta Street. There's the, the National Guard that are still out here. Uh, a few police officers also still in the area right now. But, it, yeah, it's been quiet since a couple of minutes after 9 o'clock whenever they, uh, you know, told everyone on the loudspeakers that curfew was in place and that they needed to go home. And then, you know, as we've seen over the last five nights, they, they dispersed that tear gas and, uh, and pushed that crowd uh, back, a, a small crowd. Um, do want to reiterate because I heard from a lot of protesters out here who, you know, they were saying, don't forget that the larger group, you know, is out here protesting for hours and they're gone by the time we see, you know, that that chaotic scene. So um, I do want to reiterate that that group that we saw earlier that was still here at nine o'clock, very, very small compared to the larger group, the largest group I've seen uh, out here protesting since over the weekend. Um, so again, just a very small group of those protesters, but uh, they have been gone. We've seen only a couple of ar arrests at that time, but other than that, it has been pretty quiet out here. Um, and again, talking to a lot of protesters out here, you know, it is day five, and a lot of them that I talked to said this was their first time because they'd seen it on social media, they'd seen it on the news, and they wanted to come down and see what it was all about and experience it for themselves. Um, and I talked to one young lady who was very passionate earlier today. Here's what she had to say. It's very important to let them know we have to stand for something or we fall for anything. So it's very important. Have you had that conversation? We have. I showed him the video. 
we watched the video together as a family and I showed him how it was wrong and that's why it's important to come out. He's been very hesitant, he didn't want to be a part of it, but it's important that we stand for something that we're all a part of this. He was my brother, I didn't know him, but he was my brother. It could be one of my sons, like I said, so it's very important. And uh, excuse me, that was actually um, a mom that I spoke to. She brought uh, two of her children out here earlier in the day, around 4 or 5 o'clock, just to experience uh, the beginning of the protest. And as you can he hear her explain, as you just heard her explain, uh, she was telling me why she thought it was important for her daughter and her young son to also come out here uh, to witness the protests uh, taking place here in Atlanta. A lot of people that I've talked to have called this historic and say that they've wanted to be part of something that was historic and that they also wanted to be part of change. So that's been the overall message that uh, a lot of people have told me today and um, you know they, they they came out here they protested they went home a lot of them were saying you know what it's 8 30 let's go home and we'll see you back out here tomorrow so look hope, hope this is unscientific Aisha and, and Ron and I we sit here for hours and hours and hours day after day after day and our perceptions oftentimes sitting in the studio are significantly different from you and others who are there in the park but as I have watched our coverage today, and correct me if you think I'm wrong or I am askew on this, but it looked to be a different sort of crowd today with more mothers, more fathers. At times I saw an older group of people that were there. It, it, it had more of that, that look, at least, and seemingly a vibe of some families that had come to protest as well. Am I wrong in that perception? Um, yeah, you are. I hate to say that you're wrong <laughs> on it here. But I'm yeah, always um, wrong. I'm wrong most of the that. time. I accept that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still... Uh, uh, we have seen uh, that throughout... Go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say, we have run a number of, of interviews today with some older people, with people that have been there on behalf of their sons, of their daughters, um, of, of their family. And, and I haven't seen those kinds of sound bites, as we call them in local television, um, I, I haven't seen those interviews prior to today, but we, we have shown a number of people that, that seemingly have a different reason for being there and have a sort of different narrative. Yeah, we've been, we, at least since I've been out here uh, these past five days, uh, with the ex exception of one, we've seen that huge mix of people. We've seen that, um, you know, old and young and, you know, kids are out here. And um, I, I posted a video on my Twitter yesterday of, you know, a, a kid he was probably looked about 10 years old and he was out here he was chanting with everybody else as well and we've seen a lot of different races and genders and so um, we, we've considered to see that I know that I uh, today I you know I wanted to talk to a few um, parents in the crowd because I feel like um, you're right we hadn't really been seeing that a whole lot we haven't really been talking to those parents who were bringing their children out here we've gotten a couple of emails from viewers who are wanting to know you know why protesters were bringing their children out here so I felt that you know they're asking those questions and it's important to to you know also tell that part of the story as well so I know for a fact that I did you know see you know those parents out in the crowd and I made it a mission to you know to ask them those questions to night to see you know why they did bring, bring their children out here and as you just heard uh, that one mom explain you know she thought that it was important for her son to be a part of something and to witness possible change all right hope ford thank you we appreciate it thanks for the insight i'm going to try and be right tomorrow aisha i'm going to try and have those better perceptions tomorrow again. we'll let you try and try again <laughs> okay in other news now, another story that has developed as a result of what's been going on downtown Atlanta. Six police officers now facing charges after two college students they were tased, pulled from their car and detained amid Saturday's protest downtown. Tonight we are taking a closer look at the video from seven body cameras showing what led up to all of this. And it began when the Morehouse student, Messiah Young, tried to convince police to let his friend into their car instead of arresting him. You can hear their friend crying in the body cam video as he's being arrested. You can see Spellman student Tanaya Pilgrim trying to talk to officers, but they tell her to get back in the car, which she does. Then you hear this exchange between an officer and Messiah who's behind the wheel. Hey, you, you better go to jail. Where you gonna go? Where you gonna go? Where you gonna go? Now, an officer tries to open the car door, and then Messiah appears to drive forward. Soon after, an officer points a gun at the car as another tries to break the window with his baton. 
Now, the district attorney, Paul Howard, says the video then shows Messiah leaning across the car to protect Tania from the officer on her side. She is tased moments later as an officer breaks a window on Messiah's side. Almost immediately after the window breaks, an officer tases Messiah as he sits in the driver's seat, Jeff. So now both students ended up being pulled from the car and thrown on the ground and both of them detained. The district attorney says later as the officers walk away, you hear them mention a gun. Did you shoot a gun? Yeah, he was pulling a gun. But Paul Howard, the district attorney, made it abundantly clear today. None, none of the body camera video ever shows a weapon. No weapon was found. Neither student had a weapon, not a gun. Tonight, neither student is now facing charges, but six of those officers are, their lives have changed. To hear the DA's full remarks today on the charges the officers face, look for the story on the homepage of 11alive.com. I'm just getting the latest forecast advisory in from the National Hurricane Center on Tropical Storm Cristobal. Stay with us. It's getting a little bit stronger. I'll have the latest on the intensity and the forecast track for you. Coming up, it is the video that's gone viral of an APD officer walking with protesters. We're learning more about the officer who is a former Georgia Tech football player who is making the Atlanta College proud. A look at a very clear downtown Atlanta as night five of protests wrap up. Stick around. We'll be right back. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? A fifth night of protests in downtown Atlanta have come to an end after curfew went into effect at 9 p.m. sharp. National Guard crews moved in just about 30 seconds after that curfew was on the clock. 11 Alive Chinu Her has been bouncing around on the scene for us tonight. Chinu, what are things looking like? It looks like the mission tonight was clear and it moved out fast. Yeah, Aisha, law enforcement moved this out really fast. As, long, as soon as 9 p.m. hit, uh, they started pushing the crowd out uh, down the street, and now you can see uh, everything is winding down. Most of the law enforcement officers uh, and the military personnel are all out of here, so the, everything's just winding down. Some of the vehicles are out here right now, uh, but for the most part, everyone's gone, um, and most of them were here all day. Uh, we were here set for several hours tonight. We walked all around the downtown area, and they were here. They were uh, near the interstate entrance blocking it off. They were at the Capitol. So, uh, yeah, the crews here are very exhausted tonight. Um, and we have to mention, uh, for most of the night, the protests were peaceful. There were there was nothing really that startled anyone. Uh, there was a brief moment right around the time the curfew was going to hit that was a little tense as uh, some protesters threw water bottles at the law enforcement officers. But there were also lots of protesters trying to get those people to stop. So right after uh, that started happening, uh, law enforcement did uh, shoot some tear gas into the crowd and started pushing everyone out of the way. But that this area cleared out uh, about uh, 30 minutes after after nine when the curfew hit. So again, right now, everything's cleared. Uh, no protesters out here. And uh, it's just uh, right now, again, uh, law enforcement winding everything down. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We had a warm day out there today. It was dry. We were in the mid 80s. 85 was our high. We should be around 84 for this time of year. So we were one degree above average. Same thing this morning. We got down to 66. We should be at 65. So that was also one degree above average. We've had a dry pattern the past few days. No rain here in Atlanta and our surplus now is below 15 inches, but we still have a really big surplus there at more than 14 and a half inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. Now earlier I mentioned that we had a brand new update in from the National Hurricane Center. And as you can see here, this is the 11 p.m. advisory. It just came out a little bit early here. Uh, this is showing the storm still in the southern Gulf there at the Bay of Campeche. It has increased in strength a little bit, though. Now 50 mile an hour winds and with the last advisory it was 45 mile an hour winds. Earlier today it was 40 mile an hour wind, so it's increasing just a bit in strength there. Here's the latest in the forecast track showing it meandering there, even going inland and losing strength before it turns back to the north, moving through the Gulf of Mexico. By Saturday late, 60 mile an hour winds in the center of the Gulf, and then late on Sunday, potentially approaching the north central Gulf Coast region. Remember, don't look just to that center line. Look at the entire cone. We're watching that track because since we are on the right hand side of this, that's going to enhance some of our tropical moisture. Take a look at this. This is our forecast model comparison where the yellow circle is GFS. The blue is Euro. We watch this part right here and it just kind of hangs out down there. And then the models are pretty consistent here, bringing it up near the north central Gulf once we get into later on Sunday. So we'll keep watching any changes in that forecast track and the intensity because any of those changes could impact our forecast. We're generally going to see low rain chances tomorrow, 30% chances for rain Thursday, Friday and Saturday with a little more Gulf moisture moving our way and that increase in moisture will give us a little better chance for some showers Sunday, Monday and Tuesday with highs in the low to mid 80s. Tonight, the story of how sports intersects with the events and the unrest that we have seen uh, along with the political protests uh, over the last week or so. This is the story of Atlanta Police Lieutenant Kevin Knapp, and he came together with protesters walking with them. Knapp's background includes sports. In fact, he is a former football player. Maria Martin tells us how those who know Officer Knapp are not surprised by his gesture. We're all wondering, what, what is that big circle? Why are they getting together? Protests have been present in Atlanta for days, mostly moments of peace. <laughs> with moments of unrest 
and sometimes viral moments of hope and inspiration. And you tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. And you tell me if I'm wrong. If you hold my hand and walk back that way yeah. and y'all walk yeah, with us together, walk. they are going to go home. Jill Knapp watched an interaction between her husband, Lieutenant Kevin Knapp, and protesters on Sunday night go viral on social media. I got sent a video that Twitter video. I said walk with me. Come on, go, uh -huh. go. Come on. Yeah. Let's go. Yes, the cops are walking with us. I don't think anybody can watch that without crying. <laughs> like, I'm crying just talking about it. He would be out there with them if he could. That meeting with that protester and, and them hugging it out and holding hands and walking together. He came home so elated. So who is Lieutenant Knapp? High character, played hard. He was an offensive lineman at Georgia Tech from 1996 to 2000. A Georgia Tech football player in this great city doing something positive for our community. Uh, you know, I, I thought it was powerful. Jill says that change starts with a conversation and the actions her husband displayed in the middle of downtown Atlanta. Seeing that and knowing that or getting somewhere or trying to get somewhere, trying to understand each other and make a change safely, that was pretty incredible. Today, many athletes and teams have been posting messages of solidarity with the protesters in response to the death of George Floyd. Tonight, a special commentary from Alex Glaze, who tells us why he believes that statements and social media trends are no longer enough, particularly from college teams and coaches. Black lives matter. Why is that so hard for college football and basketball coaches who make a lot of money off the blood, sweat, and tears of black athletes to say? This weekend, all I saw was cookie cutter statements from coaches and teams denouncing racism, calling for love, peace, and unity. And that's nice, but it's not enough. Listen to your players, talk to them, ask how you can be a part of the change that is so much needed right now. Every year, coaches go into the homes of black families and look a mother or father in the eye and tell another family that they're going to treat that family's son as if he were their own. But how many coaches called their player crying, worried about them simply existing this weekend like my mother did? How many coaches went beyond denouncing racism, which is an easy thing to denounce, and denounced police brutality? How many college coaches even try to understand what their players are going through on a regular basis? People are out marching in the streets because police are killing black people and not being held accountable. Black lives matter, and not just when you're benefiting from them. Denouncing racism and quoting Martin Luther King isn't enough. Biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 
We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. All right, we are wrapping up a fifth night of protests in downtown Atlanta. The scene clear just about, I'd say 10 minutes tops after the curfew went into effect at nine o'clock, Jeff. It has been very quiet. I think uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, and that certainly is the case right there. Ron and Aisha are up on 11 Alive. Coming up in about three minutes, switch on over to 11 Alive. Thanks for watching this. Good night. Dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people, or are you doing this to make money, or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the